I've been dying for the guest I could have on to, to share a cigar, yeah. and today's the day. We're Chris in this room, man. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we are. Shit's about to go down. I'm feeling something in my spirit. Chops and Taps with Aaron Della Vidova. Hello, friends, lovers of art, life, creativity. Welcome back to Chats and Tats with me, your host, Aaron Della Vadova. I am here today with a very distinguished artist in our community. He was born on a, a small farm in Tennessee, which I quite like because I am a Midwest Iowa boy, and I just have an affinity to anybody that comes from these small little rural areas. He grew up in Oceanside, which is also kind of cool because I don't know if many of you know that down here in Southern California, Oceanside, California, I lived there for 21 years. I live about a mile from there now in Carlsbad. So we're neighbors. He's been tattooing for 25 years. His art is rooted in a traditional aesthetic. He's been featured on New York Inc., Miami Inc. He's been a guest judge on Ink Master. He's a ambassador for Monster Energy Drink. He is also the creator of The Lost Art of the Gentleman, which is, uh, I'll let him explain that to you. He's been featured in Forbes magazine. He is a mover. He's a shaker. He is a gypsy of a tattoo artist who's been around the world spreading his love for tattooing. And uh, he's just an amazing human being. We got a lot of friends in common. I've had him recommended to me by many, and it's an honor to have him on the show today. So with all that being said, please welcome my new friend, Luke Westman. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. What a great introduction, man. And who <laughs> recommended me? Was there a couple people? Some oh, good. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, my tattooers awesome. here did. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, it came up. But you've been on my mind anyway, just oh, because cool. of, uh, you know, Rob, every time I would go have sushi with Rob, we, you would always come up. And it was always weird back then that we never hung out because we lived blocks from each other. And, you were like ships in the night. Yeah. And we must have crossed so many times past. A hundred times, I'm sure. A lot of my my, my listeners are interested. Yeah. I'm interested in it's hearing the, you know, the story of how people become, you know, respected tattoo artists, especially ones that have been around for 25 years. Because, you know, once you go back about beyond 20 years ago, there was another chapter in tattooing yeah. that doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah. You're from that chapter. Yeah. I am too. Mm -hmm. And uh, it makes these stories a little more, um, uh, a little more juicy. I don't, I'm not talking about, you know, dirty stories or anything. Sure. It's just, you come from a different part of it. And I want to get into that later, where tattooing was, where it is and where yeah. it's going. Let's save that for later. Sure. But you, your career is that journey through yeah. those phases. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, how it all got started for, for you and tattooing and walk us through a little, little quick bio of your, your journey through tattooing and how you ended up in Costa Mesa. Okay. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to tell quick. Because there's oh, so wait, many. Wait, I'm gonna interrupt you. You just got started because what? He's a big cigar smoker. I am a cigar guy. Yes, and uh, I've promised him that we'd share a cigar today. <laughs> so we'll test your room's ventilation system. <laughs> so far, so good. Love being the first here. For you so. viewers out there, it might look like we're in this giant sound stage, but we're actually in about a 20 foot by 10 foot little room. Two large cigars being smoked. So yeah, this is a hopefully big one. in 10 minutes you can still see our faces on camera. Mm -hmm. Well, cheers. Mm. And thanks for having me. We're also I, having a nice glass of scotch today. This is the Belvini uh, rum cask, 12 year. Cheers. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me. And I will say I've been a longtime fan of your work from a distance. You know, uh, like you said, we never met, but I've been aware. How could I not be of your beautiful work? Especially the bodysuit shows. I really caught notice. Those were just really impressive. I mean, obviously that was probably a lot later, but well, you've been rocking for a long time. Yeah, yeah, Guru, 20 years now. I've been tattooing 32 years. We've had our, just had our third installment of, we call it commitment. It's when all the tattooers here and some guests come along and we paint bodysuits, you know, just as yeah. a, a way to reach a little, like, you know, the idea of like, if someone let you do anything from neck to ankles, yeah. what would you do? You know, it, it's, a, it's a fun exercise. It really lifts the spirits of the shop. It, every time I do one, I go back to tattooing with new ideas. And so thank you for acknowledging that. They're fucking a bitch to do. They're, um, not, you know, personally, but as a shop and as a show, it's expensive. Yeah. It doesn't, I don't make no money on it. It's just the whole thing's a fucking yeah. hassle. But it's uh, probably one of my proudest achievements out of all the extra outside of actual tattooing that I've done in my career as those shows. So, you know, I did an art show in San Diego once years ago and I painted my ass off. I just gotten out of a breakup. So a lot of times art is inspired by pain mm -hmm. and it wasn't painful, but I was actually happy that I broke up with this girl, but I painted my ass off. I must've did like 20 new pieces that were at least poster size. And I did an art show and I did it 
I didn't put anything for sale. And someone asked me, why aren't you selling it? I said, I just want people to know I'm fucking doing it, mm. you know? And so like when I think of your body suits and it's not about the money, it's about showing off the work. It's like really letting motherfuckers know, right? It, yeah, I call it an exhibition. And, and because, yeah. Because it's, you, you can sell them, but they're so big and most people can't fit them in their house. Yeah. We, we just don't sell much of them. You know, we know that going into they're so It's just like impressive. you said, it's more to just to show the world. Yeah. And not even, I mean, that sounds kind of arrogant and you know, motherfuckers know, but like, just like let people know what can be done and we're doing yeah. it. Keep yeah. everyone dreaming. Keep the mm -hmm. artists dreaming. Keep the clients dreaming. I, I can't tell you how many people have walked in here, you know, and they're walking through and they're like, what, what's going on with all these bodies? I'm like, well, that's, that, you can see it clicking. Like, yeah. oh, I could do that. I could, yeah. okay, I was here for a, a half sleeve, but they start thinking bigger, you know? And of yeah. course, in my career, I was lucky enough to do a few body suits and yeah. I know those shows helped inspire my clients to be like, yeah. oh, wait a second, let's, let's, let's go all the way. People here. need to see it sometimes, a lot of times. Build it and they will come, yes. as they say. Yeah. So I cut you off in the beginning because I couldn't wait to have this cigar yeah, in my mouth it. and we have them burning nicely. Yeah. Mine's going great. All right. So I cut you off. So let's hear okay. your, you know, I described you earlier as a bit of a gypsy, you know, you, I mean, yeah. in the best way possible. Yeah. You've traveled a lot. You've been a lot of places. Your journey isn't a one town, one place, no. one shop. So let bring us to the journey a little bit. Okay. So my parents were in the army in the seventies and during that time they were in Germany and my dad had a classic love story of like, I see that girl, I'm going to marry her across the room kind of shit, which I love, you know? So he started their relationship like that. They got honorably discharged from the army to be together. So it was based on love, you know, and like passion and they came out and they then allowed they, them to be discharged. From well, the I don't know the details of like what it was, but my dad worked it out. He was a phot photographer in the army and I don't know what my mom did. Um, that's a lot. Another part of this story is I didn't really grow up with them but they really became infatuated with the hippie era. And it was right in the seventies when all that was happening. And they heard of this guy, uh, Stephen Gaskin, who was a famous like leader hippie guy that started a farm in Tennessee. There's documentaries about it. It's called a, a commune or some shit like that. Heard and the it, name. and it's a familiar. natural organic living community. And in the, in the seventies, that was like, you know, it was, yeah, it was yeah. big, right? Yeah. Like organic living, vegan, like mm -hmm. all this solar power even then. Mm -hmm. And my parents wanted to live there and be part of that. They were like, let's go here. So they went there and my mom and dad became part of the community and they ended up having my older brother there. But during that time, my dad started to feel like it was too organized and he wanted, it was too organized for the hip free mm -hmm. hippie life. So he actually got them kicked out of the farm because of, he did things against the guidelines of the farm, whatever it was. But I just remember hearing a little bit of that story. But my mom really wanted to have her kids there because there was a famous midwife. I think it was Ruth Gaskin or uh, no, Ida May or something. I forget the name. It was a famous midwife in that time because it was like groundbreaking, like public, well-known midwife, wrote books. So my mom was like interested in that natural childbirth. So my brother uh, was made there and came out and then they moved to like Chicago. And then when I came along, my mom was like, we're going back there even though we were kicked out because we want to have our next kid there. Natural, this is the lady to do it. So the story that I heard is we were living in a no power little shack in the back of this farm. I don't know how many miles or acres this farm is, but we were there. My mom said we were happy. We were just everything we needed, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a saying in, in, Hawaii, in a Hawaiian proverb, there's two ways to be rich, work more, want less, right? My parents didn't want much. Mm. So they were loving, well the, they were loving the, the community and being out there with the family tight didn't need power, electricity, none of that. There was a bathhouse. I was born in the bathhouse. My mom thought she had to go to the bathroom and I came out real quick. Mm -hmm. So. Couldn't wait to get here. Yeah, I was ready, man. <laughs> so I came out and then my parents, uh, at some point, maybe when I was old enough or strong enough, they hitchhiked to California. This is back when people were hitchhiking, right? right. Thumbs out. So I don't know the details. <laughs> I would really love to know the details of that trip. Like who picked us up or like how many people. Maybe someone listening will yeah, write yeah, in. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, and so we made it all the way to California and then. So you're an infant, you're a newborn. I'm a newborn. I have like one photo of that time. And my mom had me in a sling and my other brother was Hitch like, my dad. Across. Yeah. That's rad. And, uh, so we had this adventure. I didn't even know I was on, you know, and, uh, we came to Southern California, uh, San Clemente, San Onofre, and my parents started living in state beaches. So they would go up and down the coast and get little slips and get a tent and just, uh, live up and down the coast. So I grew up with a very like holistic nature, mm -hmm. healthy lifestyle, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even 
I, I loved it. I had a great time. I was running around climbing trees, wiping my butt with leaves. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just a little nature kid. And then I found surfing and got into that, which was awesome because we were up and down the coast. Um, but then around 13, 14, my parents decided to move and leave. Uh, my dad worked for the city of Oceanside in the agriculture department. And it was like, I had a moment of stability. And then that went, they were like, we're done with this shit. We're going to the mountains and that's where we want to be. But at that time, as a young kid, I had jobs. I already worked. I was like very like independent. And um, my parents left. They didn't say, hey, come with us. <laughs> they were just like, we're going. And I said, what the fuck? How old are you? I'm like 14. And oh, uh, <laughs> you could go. It was up to you. If I was the parent, I'd be like, you're coming. <laughs> yeah, but you, they gave you the option to yeah, go. Yeah, we're going to do this, you know. You're welcome to come, you, but you, you can stay here. <laughs> you know, here I am, this like kid. And I, I was a kid and I was sad. I remember crying at the moment, like, what are you doing? Like, but I also had such a responsible young life. I had like two jobs and I had some good friends. And one of my friends was like, you're just living with me. And uh, I was like, okay. And so I didn't, I didn't feel the homelessness or that pain of like not having folks. I just had good friends there behind, behind mm -hmm. me. And so I jumped right into that with them and my friends became my family. And it was just a beautiful thing to like feel that with friendship. Mm -hmm. So I had a few key friends that were like, you're living with me and I could stay with them and feel safe with them. And that was like my teenage years was like living with friends, couches on the, on the bed, like next to my best friend's bed on the floor or on the couch in the living room. And like with a group of buddies and like, but didn't feel it didn't feel bad. I just felt like the security of my friendships because it felt like we were honoring friendship. And like, I didn't like, and I just felt taken care of. One of my best friends, um, this guy, Brian Talbert, who owns um, Violent Gentleman, a hockey brand in, in California or yeah. in Costa Mesa. He kind of took me under his wing too. And he was a loud talker. And, um, you know, at one point in my life, he was like, you're living with me and my mom on bunk beds, dude, you're good. Like, and so I had all these people just like carrying me a little bit and I didn't even know it. You know what I mean? I just... I didn't have to feel like scared because I had friends there and it was really special. Kind of a blessing. Yeah. And I, I also was like instilled with hard work and I was instilled with like, don't fucking cheat or anybody over. Don't, like, so I had good work ethic, good character as a kid. I was like, I don't know where I got it because I was on my own and I'm dancing around parts of Oceanside that were still gang ridden, you know, mm -hmm. Bloods, Crips, you know, um, Essays, Basole, or, uh, Basole, um, you know, the different gangs that were in, in the Valley and in, in Oceanside and, I just kind of navigated all that. And that's what fit, brought me into tattooing kind of. My older brother had a friend. I don't know if you know him, Jason Betts. Oh yeah. Yeah. Who yeah, I know Jason. He's a big tattooer in Still Oceanside. There, yeah. He's really holding the flag. I yeah. mean, he's really, he, he, guy's a hustler, man. Yeah. He really, big time. every time I visited him and it's been a while, but he is like working in his own shops. He's got him running. He's got a couple now or two or three, right? Two, definitely two. Two, yeah. And he's Might just, be. he's in it. You know, and so he um started There's one in downtown is dope. Yeah. Like a tattoo museum. And, and they've preserved that old uh, the arcade. Yeah, the arcade. Yeah, the arcade, yeah, and they've they preserved a lot cool. of that that history, which was a lot of history with tattooing in Oceanside because of military and mm -hmm. so he started tattooing me as a kid, fifteen, sixteen, um, at his house, at his apartment. <laughs> and the cool Another. thing I always remember from getting my first one, I got Westman across the back because all the gangsters were getting old English across oh, yeah. the back and I wanted to posture up and look tough, you know. Because I wasn't necessarily tough. I was just trying to navigate that, you know, that vibe. And so I always say I always started getting tattooed for armor, you know, back mm -hmm. then. Because even then it was a lot less acceptable. You look like you've been to prison or you look like you're part of a gang. Mm -hmm. Like that was really the association with tattooing. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I want that because I just don't want people to mess with me as I'm moving and trying to work and figure my shit out. Mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm in it with these people. But I'm not them, but I also want to navigate through here without like too many problems. You know, I, I need to look tough. I was a scrawny, skinny kid. I was tall. So I started getting tattooed by, by Jason and I just kind of, it just hooked me. Right. So I was like, I love this. I love, you know, as a 16 year old getting tattooed on a milk crate in his apartment. I remember he had that Gothic, um, Gothic lettering book. You remember that? Like every shop had it. It was just like Gothic lettering. It was like one of those. I remember Ref a few lettering books Yeah, like it was that. just an old yeah. reference book. And yeah. so he was like, take this, pick the letter you want, go to Kinko's and print out the different size fonts you want. Right. But I went down to Kinko's from his apartment, printed out some lettering. Oh, this one looks cool. Printed out a page. Then he made stencils of it and pieced seven, seven letters together across my back. <laughs> and I'm sitting in his apartment, in his um, you know upstairs apartment. And he had bicycles, fishing poles, wetsuits, surfboards, they were all traded from the neighborhood to get tattooed. It was just so cool to me at the time. 
like stolen car stereos, whatever. <laughs> and we're sitting in there and I'm on an egg crate and I'm getting tattooed and I'm looking around. And I'm like, this is fucking cool. I don't know. It just felt cool to me. And it, you know, it hurt and I remember sweating and, but just being so stoked. So I knew I had the the line to him to get tattooed. So every few weeks I, you know, I was working, I, I got a job as an electrician young. It was like a great job, stable, made money and could be tattooed. So it was the perfect job as a kid, you know, 16, 17 year old, I'm, I'm making money. I don't have big overhead. I'm staying with my buddies. We're, we're all splitting the rent somewhere in Oceanside for, you know, depending on which room we're in, it's $300 to four or five, you know? And, uh, I just got tattooed and, and fell in love with like getting tattooed. And then the shop about face opened, which was, a, it was like the first illegal shop in, since the fifties. Right. And that, that wasn't Jason's. Mm -mm. No, that was like it was a piercer. Company. It was a lady who was okay. a piercer yeah, and she just that. lobbied and had the ins to the city and like made it work. And it became where Jason started working. So I'd go there mm -hmm. as a kid, I'll say 18 and started getting tattoos and then seeing other artists and seeing like, holy shit, like this guy has a different style and paints and does this and really like saw tattooing for to art. The shop yeah. And just yeah. seeing other artists and like, holy shit, like right. this guy paints traditional, this person's because into Because up like, until then you just got your tattoo experience. It was his apartment. Yeah. Basically. I brought in a comic book and said, I wanted this mermaid and he would be like, cool. And he'd do it right. or the old English lettering or whatever. So then I got exposed to other artists that were artists. Mm. And I met this guy who was a surfer. I surfed at the time and he tattooed really well, traditional. And him and I just hit it off, you know, like kindred spirits. And we surfed together and he started tattooing me. And then one day he asked if I want to learn how to tattoo. And it wasn't even on my mind, you know, like at, back then there wasn't shows. It, like, it was like this mysterious profession, right? Like mm -hmm. you don't even think like I'm going to be that because you're like, how are you even that? What is that? Isn't that funny? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to cut you off, but it, it's the same. I got tattooed. It was, I don't want to get into my story, but it's the nice. same thing. These are fucking this great. It's my, I'm going to, I'm going to back into smoking cigars. I want 25 of these yeah. immediately. Yeah. I don't think you can buy them here because you can't do flavored in, anymore in the States. I think so. You might have to order them online or something. I'll some figure it shit. out. Yeah. We'll go oh, gangster. Yeah. We'll get them. This is great. They're good um, to have on deck. But no, the same thing. I'm getting tattooed. I am an artist, but in my mind, there's just some wall. Like, it's like, uh, like thinking I'm going to become a magician or something. Yeah. Like, I don't know. There are magicians and I'm not. Yeah. And uh, I have a different story, but I had a just an aha moment one day where I could just connect the two. And I'm like, why Why can't I be? I think I got tattooed enough to, to see yeah. it and be like, wait, they're no different than me. I can, yeah. yeah. So I it's funny the way you out. put that, how you just, you love tattooing. You loved, um, um, you love getting tattooed. You probably already were an artist at some point. Were you drawing at this point? So back to the hippie roots. I mean, anytime I, if I ever said I was bored, my mom would be like, draw or paint or do something. So you had that so in there. There was crayons going on. The becoming a tattooer was just like, there was a wall there. Yeah, just the profession. And also I would say like, I personally was really worried about survival. Mm. I was on my own. I was living with my friends yeah. and my friend's parents. It wasn't about like, oh, I live art. I'm going to be like, a tattooer. I need a real job. I need to fucking make sure I can survive. Right. I need to pay these bills. So the jump to tattooing was very hard. Mm -hmm. I did a long apprenticeship and was probably ready earlier. I did about a two year, like a pretty old school apprenticeship. Luckily it wasn't shitty. Like no one treated me shitty. I, I had to sweep them up and clean windows and dump trash and run errands. But no one was treating me shitty. People were respectful to me. I, I heard you hear stories of all kinds of weird apprenticeships. I've got a few of those stories. So I, I was I was privy to a lot of great tattooing, classic old school, but wasn't like mistreated or treated like shit. I was respected, you know, and maybe that was just because who I am or whatever the the combination of the people around me were. So, but to make the leap from a, a job like an electrician, I was probably making like seventeen bucks an hour at the time, which was great. Mm -hmm. You know, I could get tattooed, whatever. And uh, to be a full-time tattooer with no clientele, there's no internet, like that world was so like, fuck, how do I make a living? Like, I'm still like figuring it all out, like mm -hmm. figuring out the world of tattooing. But when my buddy asked me and like was, wanted to guide me into it, uh, I took about two weeks and it was really about making a living. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, I want to express my art. It wasn't like that. It was like, I love tattooing. I love the street side of it. I love the art side that I'm discovering. I love that these tattooers are traveling and like worldly and like, the ones I met, I was really interested in that. And it was all new, but um, yeah, I was like nervous to not be able to make a living. And mm -hmm. that was my number one. And honestly, to this day, it's still that, you know, this is why I fuck with trying to do other things. And I, I and not to take us way off on a different tangent, but for me, life is about my human experience and treating people well. And it just happens to be that I landed on tattooing and that's been my vehicle. Mm -hmm. 
but it, I don't need to like wear shirts to say I'm a tattooer. My profile never said I'm a tattooer. You see what I do, but like I'm a human here experiencing all this and I'm trying to do the best I can and treat people the best I can and figure it all out and have a nice time doing it and make a cushion. And, and for me, it's always been trying to make a good living. And it, it's never been about like, I got to get all the money I can and nice shit. Never. But I'm always like, I got to be stable. I've got So I've always really had that instilled in me and like, uh, even hustle sounds kind of shady, but it's like hustler, a hard worker. And um, tattooing has just been my vehicle for 25 years and it's done me right. So I've tried to do it right, but I'm not bound to it. Mm. I could change any profession in my life and have a great time doing it because how you do anything is how you do everything. I like and, the way you put that. You know, there are, yeah, there are, I feel like there's two different types of tattooers out there. The ones that completely identify with their, yeah. which it's By the cool. way, it is cool. It is it's cool. It's a beautiful profession. It's a beautiful profession, but it's their identity. I mean, it's, you know, and I've always, I've been more like you. I've never felt like I, Aaron, and then tattooer drops after that. It's like, no, I'm a, I'm just a, a, a human on earth yeah. who likes creativity, who, you know, likes all these different things. And oh yeah, I, I actually do tattoos a lot too. And I like to paint and this and that, but yeah, it's never been an identity thing. And back to your other point about the, uh, stability of tattooing and i think this is really a cool part of of a lot of artists story there is a giant leap of faith i mean the reality is we all have to eat and pay our rent and yeah. not meet musicians and pro skateboarders and and uh tattoo artists and different types of artists and and they all have a moment where they're just like they they basically free fall into it and just hope to fucking yeah. god yeah they don't end up living in the streets you yeah. know and I, yeah. I really i really think the universe favors the bold you know i i yeah i don't know i don't want to get too deep into what the universe is and god and yeah. all this shit but I, I just i just go based on what i've seen and when you lean in with with a, a good uh solid belief in something a good honest belief in something it, it likes to let you fall for a minute. That's what I've noticed too. It likes to let, make you think it's all fucked, but yeah. it eventually always rewards those people, but yeah. it's going to make you walk through that ring of fire. And that's what you're talking about. You're talking about leaving a good job. They paid yeah. the rent. Yeah. Going into this thing that's filled with chaos and mystery and <laughs> there's drug no addicts drug and, addicts and pirates. And yeah. There's no mm -hmm. guarantee of, of fuck, let alone making money. Maybe I might end up in a, in a, a back alley fight and get all my teeth yeah. knocked out i mean shit like that happened when i was yeah. going through it you know it was scary yeah. but um but it was also beautiful yeah. and it was it was a great filter to the tattooers of our generation now yeah trust me all you guys out there that are five years in i love all of you i love yeah. you guys mm -hmm. i love all you guys that are printing ai art and tattooing fucking photorealism i love it all i'm not judging i'm just describing the differences in in our generation yeah. that was the difference yeah you had to be willing to go all in it was an all-in yeah. kind of decision Caution to the wind and it was, yeah and it was scary it was it was yeah. a little bit scary but yeah back to you now that that, that was what you were so toiling I, with and you finally just so i jumped it. in and i i um kind of got under my friend's care as far as like learning how to paint flash and and learning a little bit about tattooing and then he got a job at dave gibson's lucky's down here and then that's how i found my way to downtown san diego to to lucky's and so he parlayed for me i was working as an electrician 17 years old to be the apprentice there and i remember dave was like he can come clean up he's not an apprentice and that's what they did back then right you're not an official apprentice but Right. You're able to be here and listen and be around it. And maybe if you can figure it out and put enough stuff together, you can become one, but you're not one. Right. You're not going to be one. Yeah. Don't give um, it to him too early. And look, man, I really struggle with uh, when we ever, we talk about the old days uh, as tattooers, I don't want to glorify them and say they were better. I don't want to say this area is shit. I don't know this era. I come from that, but I really just want to experience it. I want to see what the young guys are doing. I don't want to say, why are you doing that? Cause we did it like this. I'm very like, guarded in that because i don't want to be my old boss was that mm. fuck those guys fuck that new school mm. fuck this and that and i always saw that as like oh that's cool but i just want if someone's a good person and they're trying to do it right i want to be down for them mm. and i don't care if they're honoring i mean we're not making acetate stencils anymore like what part of it are we holding on to the rotary the freaking coil we just choose the things that make it cool and core. And so I just, am tr I always try as a seasoned tattooer to not be grumpy about it and not be one of those guys to be like, they're really ruining it. Cause we're all just fucking having this human experience, man. And, and I live by an example, right? And I'll tell you my story if you ask, and I'll show you why I do things. I've, you know, we can get into my back surgery. 
get into, you know, issues of body when you switch from a coil to a rotary for whatever reason, like there's so many layers to everything mm -hmm. and none of it is, is black and white. And so when there's a, a old school artist that's black and white on all his shit or talks a bunch of shit, I hate that. It like makes me upset and it makes me not want to be that. So I really want to embrace, you know, going into this kind of same topic, like when everyone's like, oh, there's no more room for tattooers. I'm like, no, that, I, that's never that. There's always room for great people and great artists. Mm -hmm. And I've always lived by that. And I think that's been wonderful because you can get really caught up into the hate of the new. Yeah. And, no, a uh, lot of people do. I don't at all. No. No, I'm, I'm just like you. Could, you just said it for me. I'm exactly like you. And uh, yeah, I mean, my thing is like, if, if you can sit there, make a nice tattoo and make a person happy, then you're good in my book. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's that simple. I don't care what kind of machine you're using. I don't care what, you know, no. we, we, barring um, unhealthy, you know, ways of doing yeah. work. Yeah, take that course. out of it. As long as you're not doing that, I'm down for all of it. No, that's, and that's yeah. cool you say that because a lot of people from your generation uh, um, wouldn't, it, especially considering your history and hearing a bit about, about it right now, a lot, uh, one might expect you to be a little more on that side of the fence with it all. Like these fucking mag magician yeah. wand machines. Fuck those things. You know, cartridges, no. You know. <laughs> Tell you, as a traveling tattooer, going from a cord to a cordless <laughs> machine, battery operated, is the greatest thing that's happened in my career. Oh, I'll never put mine down. But I'll always say there's so much special joy and nostalgia and mojo in a handcrafted coil. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, for me, and, you know, as, you know, getting into the, the travel stuff, I mean, I filled a passport. I worked every country I could go to and work. And uh, once I found there was a formula of like, I can travel somewhere, see it and work and make a little money to pay for the trip. I'm in. So I went nuts. Go, go on that. So you, now we've, we've kind of heard about, you got it. Now you've, you've entered into the tattoo game. Yeah. You've, you've, you've leaned in, you're, you're yeah. past the ring of fire. Yeah. And then the tattoo journey actually begins. And where does it take you at that point? So, yeah. I mean, I'll skip ahead. Cause literally dude, this, there's so many pieces of the story <laughs> with how I became an owner of Lucky's and the story with Dave. And like, there's lots and lots, there's hours of story there. So. You know, I found it, became an owner of a shop in my 20s mm -hmm. in downtown San Diego with a partner who was more in the bike club scene. And it was a wild ride. It was wild. It was navigating, trying to be a good artist. And also, you know, how I mean, it's difficult to manage people. That's a whole layer, man. You, It's hard to be a legit artist and be a legit owner and manage money and income and mm -hmm. all the legalities of owning a shop. There's so many layers to it, which has made me one of the best guest artists and, and, and employees there's ever been. I'm not wasting thermal paper. I'm cut. You know what I mean? Like I know it in and out. I owned a shop for 10 years. So, so many things I've been through as a tattooer that have been just such a great ride, but so owning a shop in San Diego. And then, I mean, I could skip ahead. Of, there's so much in there, but then from there, I met a guy that worked for Dave that started working and this is a fast forward, but there's a guy that started working for the Miami Ink guys when they started the show. And that's a whole another part of my story. Mm -hmm. I was 25. I got invited to go guest spot there while they were doing the show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my first, I don't know. The first big tattoo show ever. Basically. Which was so uh, taboo. Yeah, we should highlight that. <laughs> I mean, I understand what you're saying, but let's explain this a little bit. At that time, to go be a part of that show was like risking your reputation with yeah. all your peers, yeah. which I'm, I mean, I would have never hated on you, but I'm yeah. sure you probably oh, got bro. some hate. I got, and it's an interesting thing to go through as someone that like grew up in the old school and cared about the peers and, you know, cared about how they felt about me as an artist. Like, is, am, am I, is my work good enough? Is it solid? Is it cool? Whatever. And then go throw my, throw that to the woods and go in where these guys that are doing a show for us, for making a living. For me, it was like, oh, I, c I can probably make a better living. And I tasted it. I got in Miami and we were charging $300 for a name tattoo. Mm. And I was like, holy shit. Which today's standards would be like, there might be a thousand bucks, you know? Yeah, was, well, it was $50 downtown. Right. We did script so, names for 50 bucks. Right. So I got a taste of that. I love the environment. And we had Chris Garver there. We had amazing artists there too. Yeah. So Chris that kind of, amazing. yeah, that gave me like, okay, well, I'm around these fucking legends. They're doing a show. It's making the shop Chris busy. made everybody question it. Chris I, is, yeah. When he did it, I remember thinking that like, <laughs> he's, oh. He's untouchable, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, this guy, okay. It's, he almost like gave it, it's, uh, it's, yeah. he checked the, you know, box. It was like, okay, it's okay. 
It could it's okay, be, everybody. To Chris, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of amazing artists now, but at the time, Chris was a guy that I sat down next to and watched him draw anything from scratch. And it looked oh like gosh. the beautiful piece of art that you've never seen. I fucking took every one of those sketches I could and kept them in a book. You know what I mean? Because that, that was the only reference. You didn't have a phone. Oh, dude. Couldn't no, look it up on no. your phone. <laughs> There's no book files on your iPad. This was like you carried this Bible yeah. <laughs> that you put together with your favorite stuff. And that's how you... It was cool, man. It was commando. Yeah. But yeah, so Miami was awesome, man. And we, we, you know, just to talk a little bit about that, that was really a fun time as a 25 year old going to Miami. The show had started. There was tourists waiting in line to get in. Mm -hmm. And we'd, we'd come every day and we'd look around the corner and be like, fuck, there's like, there's like 40 people in line to get tattooed. Yeah. Or like, this is amazing. Oh, and those, those days, that fuck. was the dream. Oh, dude, it was incredible. <laughs> And so I didn't care. I don't, I don't need to be on the show. When they're not filming, I'll be in there working. And <laughs> that's what I did, dude. I worked like 15 hour days. How many years were you doing it there? Full on, maybe five. Oh. Right in the sweet spot too, man. This is going to lead us up to your back injury. Because when you first told we oh, don't know this to led me there. up to my back yeah, injury. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just thinking about the, the, the volume. Dude. And I've worked at, at some pretty heavy street shops. And I've worked, you know, I tattooed a lot myself. But that 15 hours a day for five years... You know, five, six days a week, probably took one day off to do some laundry or whatever and Dude, back at it. And the way the shop was set up, you had to basically draw the design in front of the client, <laughs> oh, which is, you could, I'm like, what the fuck? High pressure. Because, I mean, look, man, I'm a, I'm a tattooer more than I'm an artist. I'm an artist. I can draw shit, but you had to like, you, your tricks were all out there. If you had a reference book, if you had something you were blowing up and tracing, like you were exposed and you had people with their eyes on you. We, our drawing table li literally was in the window of the street oh, wow. and people could just peer in while you're drawing their design. Oh, wow. And so talk That'll about yeah. thrown into the fire as an artist. Like, right. you know, you, you worked around it and you used help. You needed help sometimes, or you just fucking winged it and drew it. Mm -hmm. Right. But for me, I'm not a Chris Garver. I need a little help from a reference book, you know, and I still to this day, but I can draw, but I'm like a 50% drawer, 50% like tattoo guy, you know? So it was a really, really interesting time. It was cowboy. It was fun. And artists would come guest spot and they couldn't handle it. I don't think I could have handled Seasoned that. vets would come and they'd be like, what the fuck, dude? The money's great, but this is crazy. Because <laughs> there was people till 2 a.m. There was endless amount of clientele. And me as like just a hardworking kid was like, well, I got to go till the people stop coming in. I got to catch up and make, you know, figure out stability, save some money, like figure it out. It was awesome, man. That's it cool. was crazy and awesome. And, uh, you know, they had the show and the energy and the, it was so fun. And I was so lucky to be there. Uh, all because of my friend Morgan Pennypacker. I don't know if you ever caught wind oh, of him. Yeah. He worked at uh, I met Morgan a few places times, around yeah. San Diego and a grumpy kind of salty old yeah. guy. And, you know, he got me in, but like, my nature kept me there. You know, people loved working around me and it, you know, I was, I wasn't fucking, you know, chest up. I was just like, cool, what do you need? Let's do it. And worked it as long as I could. And uh, my back wasn't hurting then. I was still surfing a lot. I'd come back to California. I still had luckies. And so I would like come into town, do a couple appointments and surf and like be healthy. Mm. I'm living in Miami. I'm still kind of being healthy. I'm, I'm 25, you know, mm. and uh, tattooing didn't start taking its toll till <laughs> you know, later. closer to 30 mm -hmm. and 35 after I'd been like this for 15 hours a day for the, you know, that five or 10 years. And then I came home because my girl at the time, you know, this beautiful girl, I, I was so in into her, but she was so jealous and crazy. And here we are in like bikini capital, Miami beach, you know, and she would always go, all you do is tattoo hot women all day. And she was so jealous, right? Girl looked at me. I mean, I was, I was a good looking young guy. You know, I didn't have great style, but I was, you know, a cool, cool young kid. And, um, Every time she visited me at the shop, I was tattooing a hot fucking bathing suit chick. And I'm like, damn it, you should have came yesterday. I was tattooing some big meathead, you know? <laughs> but um, for her and, and, and for my, I, I was talking about this a little bit before we started. Um, there was a turning point where I was like, if I don't stop sucking this tit, I'm going to be attached to it forever. And if, I, if it cuts off, I'm not going to have any business. Mm. This was pre-Instagram, pre-making your own name. And I just started to see like, not to make yourself a brand, but it was like an early stage of like, I have to like maybe get my client's email or, I mean, I always treated them good. I mean, I come from a street shop where you just, we just had conversations with the clients and we treated them well. And that was one of the best things I learned in tattooing. It wasn't about, even then, it, I mean, it wasn't about quick dollar. It was about the human connection. I'm doing something for them. And I still feel that to this day. It's never like a transactional thing. It's a very intimate thing. Whether you're getting a fucking cityscape outline or you're getting a half sleeve. For me, 
It's like, I'm giving you this moment and you get all of me for this moment. Mm -hmm. All of my expertise, all my years, I'm going to give this to you, whatever this is. And I still feel like that to this day, even if it's a kanji mm -hmm. or fucking lettering, whatever. Yeah, I um, agree more. That's helped me connect with my clients over the years and build clientele that's been with me for years and years. I'm sure you have people that you've yeah. seen for 20 years and their families, right? Yep. That, that has never went away for me. But the fact that I lived in New York and lived in Miami and traveled, I spread it really thin. I didn't have this concentrated San Diego right. group. They're all you know? over the place. They're everywhere. I have a nibble everywhere. Scotland, mm -hmm. Ireland, Japan, mm -hmm. everywhere I've been. But man, it was exciting, you know? Mm -hmm. It was so exciting. And I, I, I can get lost in, in these time periods and these stories, but so you guide me if you want well, me to. Well, I just, you mentioned Japan and I think if I know, you, you, you met uh, Horiyoshi while you were out in Japan, right? Yes. You, tell yes. me about that. That was awesome, man. The legend, and, I mean, come on. And, and a lot of my career, I've been disappointed in meeting my heroes. Mm, but not and, this time. Not this time. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? Like they say, don't meet your heroes, whatever, because maybe they're not the person you think they are or whatever. And with tattooing, I've met a lot of guys I've looked up to, and I just hated the vibe. Mm. I had guys that I admired for so long, and I met them, and I was like, I can't wait to get a tattoo from this guy. And I met them, and they were shitty, shitty to me, shitty to a friend, heard, you know, like, and time and time again, I cared less about my peers. Mm. I just care about the person, how they treat people. And um, when I met Harry Yoshi, it was really cool, because he was a guy that you admired at a distance, I mean, I saw him during the internet era. So we see his work and books and beautiful bodysuit books that he's done. And, you know, his, his legend has, has hit America well before the internet, right? Mm -hmm. One of the few. So I was in Japan on like my second trip there. Uh, I was at a car show. I didn't go for tattooing. I went to like a, a classic car show with my, some friends. And I was with uh, this guy, Compton David, who's this dope gangster he, you always see him at conventions with his shirt off and it's a Compton on his stomach and he's heavily, beautifully tattooed by Chewy Quintanera. I hope I'm saying his last name right. I don't know if I ever say his name right. One of my favorite black and gray artists. One, because he's incredible. Two, because he's the kindest guy. And I love that combination, you know? One without the other sucks to me, you know? You're great, but you suck. Or you're a great guy, but you suck. <laughs> so I'm out there with Compton David and he said, hey, we're going to see Hariyoshi 3. Come with me. And uh, I looked up to Dave. He's a really cool, respected, you know, client, tattoo client, you know. And um, he brought me through a mutual friend who set it up. We went to visit Hiroshi in Yokohama. And uh, I haven't had too many great tattoo trips. You know, my trips have been great with my clients and little shops and meeting people of the cities and the countries. But um, I've been let down by a lot of heroes as far as just attitude or ego or and not they're not all like that right but enough to left the imprint like I, I was a young guy at conventions and i'd go to somebody and say oh you, you know love to get tattooed and it would be like this arrogance or to a few of the main guys that i looked up to had a few of those experiences yeah. i know what you mean yeah because it's a very old school gatekeeping you know and i get it if you're not introduced somebody the right way they maybe will treat you different and that says something about them right i would love to i love people that treat everyone the same but so I got with Compton David and um, Yoshi, who is a friend of Horiyoshi, and he brought us to Horiyoshi, and it was on Horiyoshi's birthday. Uh -huh. And we take this, like, it felt like a pilgrimage. We took the train from, Tokyo, from uh, uh, Nagoya, and we got off of Yokohama, and we walked, and we met our friend, and then we walked up to his studio, and it's like out of a movie for me, you know? As a, I've been in tattooing. I've, I've, you know, been in it for so long. I've, you know, I've been doing it 25 years, but I've been in it 30 plus years, you know, by just being a guy there and, uh, went to his studio and he was finishing up a bodysuit on the ground. And it was like a tiny little sh upstairs in his little studio and immediately warmly welcomed. Right. And he finished up with the bodysuit guy and said goodbye. And then he was just like, even though there was the language barrier a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. we were so warmly welcomed. He, he did some art for me and, and David and uh, drew on a thing and did a handprint and gave it to us. And we just had this like really pleasant cool. few hours with him. Right. And then he was like, well, let me take you to my shop. And he has like a, a museum store in Yokohama that has yeah. like a bunch of knickknacks and all kinds of cool shit. So we walked with him there and it just had this like really good, unique, special feeling. And it felt big, you know, it mm -hmm. felt like powerful in tattooing, you know, the history he had, oh, his, his little studio had you'd see the stickers from all the artists that have visited and done the pilgrimage. And it was just a really, really impactful time. It was so warm and comfortable and cool. And uh, 
that left a lasting impression on me with him out of any tattoo like little missions i've had you know i've went and saw try to see ed hardy and sf and that was pretty nice at tattoo city but a lot of times you know it was like you're not warmly met you know unless you're introduced the right way or right. someone really vouched for There's you some other tattooer in yeah, here as to, a person right. it's like who the fuck are you in a lot of ways back then i have a weird question but it's been on my mind forever no one no one's answered it right for me is it true that Horiyoshi tattoos his clients for one hour a day? That makes sense, but I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. Have I, you yeah. heard that? I have, I've heard that. Like, so you're you're a client, you show up, and I think you go see him for an hour of work a day, <laughs> yeah. and it goes on for like however long. You take I, the journey to I, fill I don't know suit. if that's true. I just always struggle yeah, with maybe that. Maybe now for sure, but I don't know at what point he started doing that, because yeah. he probably, he put in so much work. He's done so many bodysuits and so much big scale work that I don't know if you could do an hour, only an hour along the way. <laughs> now he's older. I don't know what his status is as far as how much he's tattooing. But yeah, the the visit to Horiyoshi was really special, you know. That was one of the few that in the tattoo realm, I was like really stoked for. And it left a great memory with me. That's cool, man. That and um, Mike Wilson at Ink, Ink Smith & Rogers. You know, I, I kind of met him through the guys at Miami Ink, Garver and all them. And mm -hmm. he was the same. I stayed with him. And, you know, an old school guy that you yeah. kind of admire. I know of Mike. Through the I stories. Know, yeah. And um, he's just wonderful and an incredible artist also well i'm sure you could go on for ever i can I mean, ramble with this much well with this much traveling and and all the different folks you've met along the way that would be yeah. like its own like three hour <laughs> episode but i wanted to also because yeah. i know through all this journey you've you've tattooed some some celebrities um one i wanted to talk about was marley matlin yeah from the l word which yeah. is i i haven't seen it but i know it was a huge hit on, uh, was it Netflix? I think, I'm not sure, but she also was the first deaf Oscar winner for oh. City of God. Okay. I want you to tell me about that, but just give me one second. I had to, did someone turn the heater on? It got hot <laughs> as fuck in here. <laughs> Jesus I thought Christ. I was just in the hot seat here. <laughs> no. no, I saw both of us started sweating. I'm like, hang on, let me turn that down. We're going to pick this back up in a second. Before I do, I just want to give a big shout out to Solon Clothing, Ryan and Jeremy, good friends of mine, huge supporters of the tattoo industry. I mean, if you're into tattoo art, if you're into art in general and you like that shit on clothing, go to solonclothing.com. Some of the best tattooers in the world have their work imprinted on their clothing, plus the highest quality t-shirts and jackets you'll ever wear in your life. I mean, the guys really, really care. I could see you nodding over there, Luke. You, you, have, you know Ryan and Jeremy? I hear, I, hear they're, I hear nice things about them. Yeah, they're good people. I hear nice really things about people. them, so they're putting out good Good reputation. quality stuff as well. So that's my shout out. Thank you, Solon Clothing, for supporting the show. And now we're going to pick things back up before I had to go turn that heat down. Ah, oh, it's already Thank cooling you. off in here. We were talking about um, Marley matlin yeah uh, from the l word yeah. you tattooed her and you guys are friends i'm just i know a lot of people are huge fans of hers and maybe you could tell us a little bit about her in that situation i'll tell you a funny story when i first got her as a client and you know i have ta tattooed a good amount of celebrity and i and i hope and i think it's because of my like bedside manner and the way i kind of respect their privacy when they need it somehow she was uh introduced to me i was working in hollywood a little bit at true tattoo and got the nod to tattoo her and so i went on this little mission to learn sign language or at least enough to kind of have like a fun communication with her. Cause I didn't know what level of interaction I'd have with her as far as like, I didn't know if she could hear at all or, you know, I don't know. I didn't know the world. That's rad though. Uh, in preparation mm -hmm. for the appointment, you're like, I'm going to show some respect I and I'm going to learn her language. Yeah. So I learned that, that it was actually one of the easier languages to learn. You just don't use it much. Right. Mm, right. So, but being a visual person, it was really easy to learn the alphabet. And I learned a couple greeting words and different things. And so right when I met her, she comes into the shop and you just feel the warmth from her. But I go, um, nice to meet you, which I haven't used in a while, but it, you know, I was like, I do the nice to meet you. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, she goes, what I'm, she's like, what? Like, she doesn't, she's like, no, I don't know what you're saying. Right. And I do it again. And she's just like, hands up. And then she goes, ah, oh, just fucking with you, you know, in her distorted <laughs> voice. Um, and it just, I mean, like, wow, like a sense of humor just shined through right away, right? And she gave me a big hug and, and we worked on uh, her first tattoo and uh, we just built a beautiful friendship. And I always say it's so funny with a deaf person, I've had some of the best conversations I've ever had. And it's just because, you know, don't they say like verbal communication is one of the, the lesser forms of communication or not lesser, but like, it's just one of, right? There's like energy, there's visual, there's... Mm -hmm. There's all these other layers to the communication that was really prevalent with her because I was I was talking to someone that you know wasn't didn't have a clear communication style, right? Well, I, I can add to that. One thing I've noticed 
with some of the artists here who don't speak very great English, one of the things I've come to respect about that is when you can't just talk to somebody easily, you pick and choose what you're going to say. So it kind of makes what they say count more. A lot more intent in your- A lot your, more intent. You know, exactly. in the eyes. Like I had to learn, like I have to be looking at her so she can read my lips. Right. So after the sessions with her, which I've had many, I've probably talked to her like 15 times and I'm actually t texting with her last week about her next one. She's kind of gotten a little heavy on the, the collecting. Bug. I was tired. I was worn out differently mm. because conscious focused interaction, which mm -hmm. is something that like we don't do with each other, especially now, right? With the phones and all that shit. I have to be looking at her face and she can read my lips and it's incredibly focused. And I, I left there tired, but I also left there feeling like I had a, an amazing connection and, and communication style with her. And um, I'm guessing she felt it too, because years later, we're still very close friends mm -hmm. and she's still getting tattooed, you know, but she's wonderful. That's and cool. um, I'm a huge fan and she's actually tattooed me. Oh, she tattooed um, you. So I did a lot of this. I love you. The, the I love you sign right. on her family and her husband and her kids and her friends. Um, and I said, you're going to do it on me. And she's like, what? what? <laughs> and so I, I have a little reel uh, of that day up on my uh, Instagram. It wasn't like overly produced. I kind of just rigged it and had a couple of videos, but she did one on my hand. That's the, I love you. And it doesn't look like much, but it is actually one of my favorite tats. That's cool. Man. You know, because it just has so much more behind it. Well, you, you get this and I get this. I have a lot of, famous tattooers who have tattooed me and I have a lot of really beautiful tattoos and I've got yeah. a lot of, I, want, I don't want to call them bad tattoos, but they're just not about high quality. They're about yeah. seeding a moment and a yeah. memory. My wife's tattooed me, my son's tattooed me, you know, yeah. my friends have tattooed they're me. beautiful moments. Yeah, it's yeah. moments for them too yeah. and you, you know? And that's not even about the, the crazy yeah. rad art. It's no. just, yeah, those are some of my favorites. Yeah. For sure, Yeah, 100%. So, but yeah, I got to, I got to tattoo some cool people, man. I did a uh, Tom Hardy last year on his hand. Oh, really? And that was one. I, he's, I, he's cool. Man. I'm he's, not. I don't know him. But gaga yeah. over fame in any way. I've tried to use it as a vehicle a little bit to help my career. As far as like, I know that if I promote the fact that I've tattooed this famous person, people will get excited. So like, I value that in its own way. But yeah, when I, when I tattooed him, I got a little nervous. I was yeah. sweaty. It was in this room in hall, in LA, and I, he's like, he's he's he wanted his hand and. That was really a cool one, man. That was one of my favorites, but good people is all I really care about. Right, right. Like I really, I mean, we get stimulated off great conversation, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what this podcast is. And, and, and as a tattooer, that's what it's always been for me. Mm -hmm. It's the art and the communication moment and the energy transfer. It's not just me with headphones on doing some fancy art. Mm -hmm. It's I'm, I'm telling you stories and you're telling me stories. Oh yeah. And we're living with them. There's a visual mark of that moment on me, on us. And it's so beautiful, man. Yeah. And, I'm, you know, it's, it's not about. A, You're kind of getting into some of the stuff I also wanted to talk about, which is, you know, one of the questions I have for you is, what, what, in your words, what, what do you think makes tattooing as an art form special? And I think you're already going there yeah. with what you're saying. I'll let you continue. Well, it's, it's, but, it's different for other, for different people, right? Right. For me, it always has been the connection and the human behind it and the, the, the moments that we're connecting and giving them that moment and me having that moment with them, you know, sitting there with, a guy, just for an example of the story, I have this, this young guy, doctor, he had terminal cancer and every few weeks he wanted to be sleeved up before he died, but he was for sure dying, which is a fucking wow. heavy thing to think. Great. You know, we do tats, they're fun and there's all these different reasons behind them. Mm -hmm. These are the moments where like, wow, this is heavy and big. Mm -hmm. And so I'd spend months with this guy and his family circled around telling stories, laughing and crying. And we're, uh, we're having this this heavy exchange of just life and moments and the severe the heaviness of this person's life. I tattooed a full uh, two half sleeves on this guy. He was doing everything he could do before he passed, and the family all well, um, not well off, whatever. Like they were all well to do people, and they are all there knowing that it's ending. And I'm tattooing him, and then I ended up tattooing all the family members with like his initials. And at the end, I wanted his initials. I'm part of this, you know, and. Um, those are moments in tattooing that are really big and special. And there's all kinds of different moments, but those ones really hit me. But yeah, that one's and a big one. Yeah, I, I've heard a lot of tattoo stories. You know, it's funny. I'm having a guest on, well, they had to reschedule due to some personal, serious personal stuff, but they're coming back and uh, they're going to, the husband's a tattooer and she is a, I'm going to fuck this up, a psychologist or a therapist. But they're currently petitioning the Senate, I guess, to get approval through insurance to have tattoo, in some cases, 
be paid for by insurance as, ther wow. as therapy. And, you wow. know, I tell that story a lot and the immediate reaction I get from most people is just laugh. They're just like, ah! no man tattoos is there give me a fucking break no. you know that whole thing and i'm like you know no i think a lot of times that's probably true i mean there's definitely a lot of people i've tattooed i don't think there was much deep therapy happening in those sessions although i still think there was deep th things sure, happening sure. but i've had my own story you know i've got one that comes to mind is a, a guy that came to me a good friend now who had been um over in the middle east fought in the wars I, I don't even know what he's been through. He doesn't really talk about it, but I know it wasn't good. And I'm sure he's got a lot of PTSD and I know he has a lot of PTSD. And, you know, I did a bodysuit on this guy and, oh. you know, I did, it took me like halfway through to get him to start opening mm -hmm. up. And one of the things he told me is he goes, look, man, I don't want to look in the mirror and see the person that did all those things. I want to see somebody else. So he's changing who he is from the outside in, you know, by covering yeah. himself in these tattoos. And that was a poignant moment to me where I really had that moment of like, wow, this is a could, can be a, a deep level of, and, but to hear that story, a guy Dude. who's, who knows he's going to die, but he wants these tattoos on his body prior to that. That's a new one. I've never, you would, you would not think they would be occupying their time with, with that endeavor right? You know, at that time. Really? But crazy. it doesn't really matter what we think. I mean, it, whatever that, if you're going to die, you guess what? You got to do whatever the fuck you want. You well, want to go to Disneyland, that's it, you go right? to Disneyland. You, you want to get tattooed, you get tattooed, you know? You're doing things that maybe you wouldn't have done, or you're really going to live as hard as you can while you're still right. living. And so there was another story. I wish it ended a little bit better, not to give away the ending, but I was approached to tattoo a famous Hollywood guy. His mom was dying and she was in hospice and she did not want to die without her, one of her grandkids names on her because mm. she had the other grandkids name on one wrist. Oh. And so I'm going back and forth with him. We're, we're figuring out the tattoo. I said, I can I even tattoo in this, this hospice center. He's like, yeah, she has her own room. And we were trying to find the right day. And I'm like, look, dude, I'll cancel my appointments. I'll run up there. I'm here. Like that's a big tattoo, right? That's big in, in, in its meaning and its power, not in right. the, being a big tattoo. It was like tiny little initials. Mm. And, uh, He's like, all right, well, she's not doing good. We just moved her and, uh, you know, we'll check tomorrow. I said, like, cool, man, I'll, I'll just fucking run up there, you know, mm -hmm. I'll be there. And uh, same thing the next day, oh, she's getting worse. The problem is when you're in hospice, man, and they start giving you, um, what do they give you for the pain? End of life drugs. Well, yeah, it's just, it's morphine, it, you, you dive bomb. And I seen it with my mom. Once they give you morphine and stuff like that, there's, it's hard to come back. So I'm like, I'm here for you, man, if you want to do this. And he was trying to honor her wishes and she ended up passing like the next day. And I didn't get to do it. But just the thought of that, the whole energy of that, I mean, there's, there's power in that. And that's really, it was really, I would have really loved to do that for them. And, and, and maybe for me in its own, its own way, feeling like it's something important finally, because we always joke, we're not doing brain surgery, but there are, there, there is a lot of therapy in tattooing in a lot of ways, you know? You know, one of the things I always tell people, you know, really, really research your, obviously research your tattooer, find somebody who yeah. does art you like, but really find somebody that you vibe with yeah. because the energy frequency, I call it, that, mm -hmm. that, that tattoo artist brings to the tattoo is, Im it's embedded in you. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to name names. I've got a couple tattoos on me that mm -hmm. to this day, I look at them and I get a little bit sad, Yeah, you know, cause I remember Mm -hmm. the, the person and I remember the circumstances and they weren't rad and, yeah. and, you know, and that, and that's okay. Like I've healed from them and I yeah. almost appreciate it because yeah. they're part of my story. Sure. You know, I've got the happy ones. I've got a couple sad ones, but you know, people I don't think realize like whatever that energy, that relationship, that, that moment together with that person, every time, even if you aren't thinking about it subconsciously, you see that tattoo, it, 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 it ignites that emotion back yeah. up in you. So yeah. be careful, you know, yeah. and it's really cool to hear that how much you value that. I mean, hearing some of your stories, the fact you were willing to drive to a hospice center to give someone some initial, do you know how many tattooers at your level would just, wouldn't even take the fucking email? Like, are you kidding me? I, I, I could go to my shop today and make, you know, $2,000. Yeah. I don't have time to do this. And yeah. you, you made it the highest of priority. Yeah. That says a lot about you. That's cool. I wish I could have got to do it, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you did your best. It didn't work out. A but quick story on that topic to talk about that, that energy transfer. Mm -hmm. I had a friend that was getting a tattoo for his dad at a shop in Orange County. And the whole time he's getting this little tattoo, it's like numbers or something for his dad, tattooer was kind of hitting on his girlfriend. And he hated his fucking tat that that guy did because of that guy and that energy and the way he felt at that moment. Mm -hmm. So when I covered that tat for him, he was like, Fuck yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm done with this shit. There's it's tattoo bugged therapy. Me. It's bugged me. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. You know, and that, and that's just an example of like respecting the person that's yeah. coming in.
Yeah. And it's not about me hitting on a chick. It's about that moment for that person and what that means to them. And it's always been that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Cheers, cheers to that. No, cheers to that. And uh, all you people out there that are tattoo artists, man, if you don't have that, it's okay. Just don't be yeah. a tattooer. <laughs> just, just, there's so many jobs that you don't have to bring that a level of respect and love to the job. Um, this is definitely one of them, yeah. you know, and it saddens me to see that when I see that it's pretty rare in my shops, I've spent 20 years purifying this place. You know, <laughs> you don't yeah. always pick it up day one. It might take a year yeah. to slowly figure out this guy. He's usually good, but man, every once in a while he pulls that boner move and leaves somebody with a, basically I call it like an emotional scar. Yeah. Totally. Um, they're gone. I don't care how good you are. Fucking yeah. beat it. And, uh, luckily after 20 years, I feel like, I'm surrounded by the right that that that's everywhere around me now, yeah. but boy, it wasn't easy, but yeah, that's a beautiful thing. It's good that you acknowledge that. And I think most of the guys we roll, we roll mm -hmm. with that we know, they all get that, but we also are aware of the larger industry at hand. And there's a yeah. lot of the, 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 that other energy out there still where it's just like money or yeah. fame or whatever the hell they're after or, or ego, like I'm going to show the world, yeah. like you're just a fucking canvas, sit down, shut up. Cause yeah. I'm going to do the best tattoo in the world today. I'm going to put my headphones on. I don't need to talk to you. Your arm is just my palette, you know, like, yeah. uh, give yeah. me a picture. And I that's even... my arm. You don't get it tatted by anybody else. I always hated that. Oh yeah. The right? ownership thing yeah. and all that stuff. I... Luckily that's uh, not as prevalent as it used to be. Well, like, this I is shouldn't... all just the human experience, man. And this yeah. is where we're at. We're tattooers. We yep. get to sit with a lot of people, man. It's yep. awesome. Yep. It's yeah. like, it's a gift. No, oh, it's the greatest gift of the and whole journey. And we can make journey. a living doing art. I made a living, bro. I've been on my own and I've lived. Yeah. I can survive. I have a, I have a home and a decent <laughs> car and I'm, not that that matters, but I, I'm, it's given me stability. And so I, I, I try my best to respect it. Yeah. No, agreed. Yeah. Everything I have is because of, of everything. Everything, bro. You know, not everything. I, I wouldn't include like my, my love for my children and things like yeah, that. Yeah, no, but my, no. my um, what do you call that? My circumstances in life are good and they're, they're, they're that, that way I can provide. And, uh, and yeah. uh, the relationships that are left behind after my 32 years ended up being the most valuable, valuable part of the whole the journey, you know, the friendships. Yeah, we have know? a sign. We had a sign. I have it in my shop now, but it was in a true above the door and it said, enter as a stranger, leave as a friend. Mm. Love that. That's cool. Love that, man. I want to get a sign like that. Dude, like it that. is beautiful. And it's true. That is true. You know, there's some people you probably don't want to tattoo again, but they're rare. And most times I think probably you, I'm sure, attract really good clientele and almost like-minded in a weird way. Oh, yeah. Like people, you mirror your client in a way or they find you because they, for me, for me, okay, this is what was, what was a good social media tip when that was happening was more than just putting out my art, which obviously if you're insane, your art's going to speak for itself. Mm -hmm. But if you can mix that with a little bit of personality and who you are, yep. I've always put my personality out because I'm going to attract people that believe in what I believe in or what I stand for. Yeah. And my clientele, man, I tell you, nine out of 10 times during the week, I am excited to sit down with my client and catch up with them where they're at, what yeah. they're doing. And I get this beautiful window into their lives that, may, yeah, a psychiatrist might hear some shit, but we get such a beautiful window into these clients' lives. Well, we get long for I format very, conversations. Yeah. I feel very grateful to that. But I, I'm not one of those that say purely tattoo gave me everything because I think any profession I'd have, I'd be the same person. Yeah. But we get to, we get a, a it unique just so job. It happens it was tattooing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to be me who, whatever I'm doing, if I'm an electrician still, or if I'm an Amazon driver, whatever. And that's, you know, it's all that. Beautiful, man. Very cool. And this sort of leads us into one of my things I wanted to talk about, which was, uh, I don't know if I should call it a brand or what, or a movement, but you are the, the creator of the lost art of the gentleman, which is a, what you tell me what that is. Now I say, I like to say it's a community Okay. and, um, back on that like-minded thing. So I, I was a 34 year old single guy in New York with a pocket full of cash, making good money. And I was dating my ass off. Wonderful adventures, movie stars, beautiful models, nice women from all over the world in New York. And somehow I got instilled with some really chivalrous values and morals. I don't know if it was a little hint of religion I had when I was young or the conscience that I've had or built. I was dating these women and just hearing their stories and treating them with class. Opening the door. Just, yeah, you know, obviously like the, the obvious the classic thing. stuff, but also not being, I didn't have a loaded agenda. You know, I'm a young guy. Of course, I'm like, love to get laid and I'm single and it's fun, but 
all the interactions I have with these women, I'm just hearing about the, you know, these crazy Wall Street guys or how they're treated. And we're having these conversations with all these women all over New York City, which were, it was five to one back then. So as a single guy, it was heaven, you know, <laughs> and as a hardworking single guy with a pocket full of cash, we're going to nice dinners, we're doing cool stuff in the city. So I'm dating these women and it was right around the time where Instagram came out and it was around the time where I was figuring out how I want to present myself publicly. Right. And so like tattooing, yeah, these are my tattoos. But as I was conscious of like what I was putting out, I was also putting out things I was into personally, like treating someone kindly or respecting the elderly or and all this and that. And I would, I would do these little posts on my Instagram that at the time, it was like 2014 or 15, right when Instagram started, it was another layer of taboo, right? Like, oh, you're, you're putting yourself on Instagram and posting. It was like a, a moment in tattooing mm -hmm. where you got, you got some criticism for generally just posting. That was the yeah. early days, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> Even like, being on just, Instagram just, just was being your sellout. Yeah. I remember how many tattooers were like, I'll never get an Instagram oh, account. Oh, man. I remember just laughing, being like, see you later. Nobody I'll know. Anyone will know in five years. <laughs> Which, you know, hey, some guys pulled that off. But I mean, to pull, some yeah. girls pulled it, guys and girls. But, you know, to yeah. pull that off, to, to not be on social media as an artist. Um, yeah. You better be like a unicorn. Look, man, it, and in there for me, it was a vehicle to like help my survival. And obviously I was thriving a little it's bit because I was tool. working at famous shops, Miami Inc., yeah. New York Inc. But you work for yourself. You never know when it's going to get cut off. Yeah. So I'm look, like, look, even to this day, man, if I hit a, if I hit the right gig, I'll disappear. Like I'm not doing any of this to be known or seen ever. You see me flashing or p promoting something on Instagram. All this is part of just the hustle that I've created for myself. But if I get a ticket of some way to not be known, I would disappear. Mm. You have, my, you know what I mean? Like I'm not doing this to be known. I don't do any of my social media ever to be, look how cool I am or look what I'm doing. Mm. But for me, it was like, okay, this is another vehicle to, to survive. It wasn't to show off. It wasn't any of that ever. Um, so like I say, mark my words, if I hit a, a gig or a job, like something that puts me in a place, I'm ghost, man. You're not well, seeing I hope, me. I, I mean, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. And yeah, I, 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 mean, I kind of mean it. I would, I say that a lot too. Like I'd have I mean, a private account for my friends or something. I always tell people, you'll know when I've made it because you will never see me holding exactly. the phone again. Exactly. But, um, but so, I would, and I think you would continue some of yeah, these projects probably, yeah. You know, yeah, because, of cause of the good it's bringing. Oh, I yeah. particularly am a big fan of the lost art of the gentleman. Okay. I, I, for whatever reason, probably my father, who ingrained in me the gentlemanness of nature. He was always the guy like, you hold the door open, not just for women, no, like anybody. anybody. If yeah. you, you see somebody struggling with a grocery bag, you fucking drop yeah. everything you're doing. You help them yeah. out. You shake someone's hand. You say you're going to do it. You do it. Yeah. Like these were the things I was taught. Yeah. And, uh, and I just love it. And I, and I see such a lack of it. Not such a lack, but I do... Maybe it's the old guy in me. I'm 52 years old. And of course the kids are a little more wily and I probably had my moments. I'm sure I, I did. I did have my moments. Sure, I know for a do. fact I was too drunk at some bar and I was disrespectful right. to somebody. So sorry, whoever it was, I've learned my lesson. I try my best not to be that way anymore. But I love this idea of promoting chivalry. Well, it, specifically, I think that's in, 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 in mm -hmm. the art of the gentleman. Like it's just such a, I just think it's great to, ins, you know, promote the idea of respect honor yeah. and in love basically yeah. it's a and very high class way of being a hippie <laughs> there's, there's a saying i like and, and it's instead of bash, bashing what you hate it's promote what you love right and yeah. i and that echoed That's in cool. my brain when i was a younger guy and it's echoed now and so when i started lost other gem and i was doing some of that stuff on my personal page and i kind of wanted to disconnect it from me so I made an Instagram for Lost Art Gem and a place that could hold all the chivalry type of sayings you know and it wasn't just Class and I always hated the classic gentleman stuff where it was suits, hot women, boats, and fucking fancy cars. Yeah, that's yeah. that that's an accessory to to a gentleman. Maybe mm -hmm. some of it's like mm -hmm. even inflated, but it really was about the values and the character and the mm -hmm. core activity and action of a of a man or a woman. And uh, so I gave it its own little Instagram page, and that began the community of it. So for many years, I just fed that. And 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 you know, like a do you want a car? And you start seeing it all over the street. Yeah. I've got that way with like the gentleman stuff, you know, and the character stuff where it's like, I see somebody going through something or I see a great quote and I've just fed it over here. And now it, it, you know, built a little following back when Instagram was, was easier to build. And so it built a community of people that were like-minded that loved all those things. Mm -hmm. And so as of late, just to continue where it's at, I still just like, same thing, friends going through a breakup or something's happening. 
it sparks a little saying or something I'm dealing with. Some of that's a timeline of my own life, you know, mm -hmm. dating and all this stuff. And um, I just wanted to continue that torch. And so now I, you know, I make some product and I, I'm moving forward with like people that love it to have something tangible. So like I've made some clothes and like now I'm working on what the next steps are. And it really has never been about how do I make this make money? But everything a little bit is that like, cause I'm that guy, like where it's like, I'm still trying to fund my life and fund my stability. Um, so I, I do have a partner now and he's also a very like-minded, great guy. And we're, um, we're, we're figuring out what we're building as far as tangible things that kind of bring in that community to have something, whether it just be a hoodie or, you know, cigar tray or like, so, so we're building products in our own way and doing collaborations with people that we love. So it's not just like, oh, Nike thinks it's cool. Now we're doing it with Nike. It's like, no, this little family jeweler in our neighborhood of 20 years, my friend had been buying his wedding ring and everything else there. We're going to do a little collaboration with them and make something. And it's cool. rooted in like this real connection, not just like, how can we do a quick grab? Right. So Lost Out of the Gentleman for me is still a great like little side thing that I protect and care about as far as like just pushing positivity and, and manhood and all those things encompassing that. So that that's where that lives. And um, hopefully I can push it out a little more because I think people want it and yearn for it like I did and do. I want to make it cool again to a little bit to kind of respect all those values and that good character and the morality and chivalry. But I also try to do it in a way that's not preachy and and also very cliche. I think you've done a great job of that. I Thank think you. you represent that. I think that's what you are. I can Thanks. feel it, taste it off of you. <laughs> but you know, I do have to like, I, I, and I'm with you, but I, I just want to kind of get a little, little dicey here. Yeah. That, that's a difficult message nowadays with this idea of toxic masculinity. Yeah. So you're, I'm going to let you go there, but like, isn't yeah. that, isn't that strange? Cause before you speak, I'd like to say like, there's to me, that is such a great message. What you're yeah. talking about is, Hey, let's be authentic. Yeah. You know, you yourself, you identify mm -hmm. as a, a man, as, mm -hmm. a, as a masculine heterosexual man. So mm -hmm. do I. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in that form that you currently occupy, you're promoting authenticity, honesty, honor, respect, what, what, what's bad going on there. But there is a wave of movement out there that seems to be against, it's not, it's not against, but it can, it can go that way. You know, I, I guess, what are your ideas around that? Like it, it, you know, even with this show, like I didn't even see it coming, but, and it hasn't really come. Like I get a lot of support, mm -hmm. but, but you know, there are having people that are like, oh, you're going to try to do a, a podcast as a white <laughs> heterosexual male. They laugh. They're joking me. And I, I laugh back. But yeah. then there's a part of me. It's like, what? yeah, I'm not, I'm not, that's not the most marketable thing maybe now, or, you know, I, I, that whole subject that's happening right now. Do you have words? Do you would like to maybe, <sighs> you know, I'm still that? wrapping my head around all that as it grows and, and develops in our society. For me, I just, it's like lead by example. Uh, do what works for you. All the values will always last. Work hard, be good. Mm -hmm. I think our current culture is wild. I think there's so many things being thrown at us as men to like be feminists or, you know, do these like honorable things for the good of modern society. But I think it, it all of it's rooted is if we can just treat people how we want to be treated, mm -hmm. don't expect anything for free, work hard for it. All the shit's going to just take care of itself. We just do us. That, and that's my philosophy. Mm -hmm. I'm doing me. I'm putting out the things I believe in. Mm. I happen to think they're, they're good things. Everyone's going to see it differently. I mean, when I was doing Lost Star Gentleman in the beginning, people were like, oh, he's just trying to get laid. I was already getting laid a little bit. <laughs> um, but it was just like, this is what I believe in. This is who I am. And that was me being like transparent with like who I am. Right. Mm. And it got mad criticism in New York, early Instagram, early days of like, oh, this guy's just doing this and that. I'm like, nah, all I can be is myself. That's the the most unique thing I have is myself. I can put on some fancy clothes. I can, I can try to put this, this image on or that, but all I have is my values. Strip all of it away. It's just how I am, how I treat people every day and how I interact with people. So we do our best. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect, you know? And we're going to have those moments where we're drunk at a bar. We might say something stupid and hopefully we're not. You know, I think part of being a gentleman is, guiding your, is guarding your actions and your words. Mm -hmm. But we're fucking human, man. And we, yeah. we slip and we're not perfect. And, uh, you know, to jump into like the cancel culture society, which is kind of having ups and downs, we can't judge someone on one moment, mm -hmm. any of this, because we've all had things that we're learned from. We've, we've learned, you know, I've done things that weren't 
good or gentlemanly in my past, but we have to give people the ability to learn and we can't judge them on one moment in time. And so I, I think about this a lot as you know, we've lived and we've had a lot of communication, a lot of people around us. When someone gets canceled for something, it's always like, well, who are they today? And, and can we give them the grace to learn to be a new person? And can, can we give them the space to realize maybe what they did is not right or what's, what's not acceptable anymore? Or, you know, cause we're judging people a lot on 20 years ago mm-hmm. and we're judging people, our society is, I'm not, yeah. because I know I've seen friends be shit bags and then great husbands, you know what I mean? And like, mm-hmm. we, we have to give each other the grace to grow and learn and learn from our own mistakes and learn from other people's, mm-hmm. but none of us have a perfect crystal clear path or history. You know, mm-hmm. I think that that needs to be talked about more than like, Oh, you fucked up to like 10 years ago on something you did. Look at this picture. Mm-hmm. I think it's more about who we all are now. And none of us have a crystal clear path. Luckily I've maintained a pretty good history. I sleep good at night. I don't have like, Oh, I fuck. I hope this doesn't come back to haunt me. And I know some people have that. And I think it's uh unfortunate in some regards because a lot of people aren't who they were 15 years ago and we need to let each other learn and grow and be who Mm. they are today dude well put i like that that's great you know that that, that, that's a an angle i didn't didn't know where you'd go with it but i (laughs) i I do i do like that you went there with that because i mean if we don't have that then how do we progress like forgiveness right empathy compassion yeah, there is a, a cancel culture that seems honestly worse than the people they're canceling sometimes. The yeah. um, the lack of um, forgiveness yeah. in that culture. Now, I will say, I'm not 100% con- convinced that that culture is a bunch of actual human beings. Right, right. I think I've been told 80% of people on some of these social platforms are fucking bots, you know, and I... There's all that. Yeah, there's all that. I mean, I, I tend to go more towards what I physically encounter. Yeah. And the funny yeah. thing about that is, you know, when you read the news lines or you see the things on Instagram and, and the, the cancel culture and the, all these movements that are happening, I rarely meet people that agree with a lot of that stuff. Yeah, you know, no, like, it's, it's And I, then I wonder like, where yeah. are they? Like, it's not like I live in Oklahoma. Like I'm yeah. in a progressive city. I, yeah. I hang out in different elements. Mm-hmm. I go to all these different, I go to San Francisco. My daughter goes to Berkeley. Yeah. Like I, I mix with all these groups and I'm always yeah. asking them how they feel. And it's just so rare to see people with such extreme ideas and values that are willing to just cancel somebody because they uh, dressed up as an American Indian at a Halloween yeah. Yeah. Um, event 15 years ago, you know? Yeah, well, let's talk about that. I mean, even in that Halloween aspect, I, you know, I didn't dress up much because I was, you know, I just, you know, whatever during my young life, didn't think it was cool to dress up or whatever for, for Halloween. But the people that I thought about emulating on those holidays or something were people I admired. So like I had a friend that did, did an easy E thing when we were young, right? Looked like easy because easy is cool or whatever it, to him or, or, right. you know, I have, and it, so, so that picture of him looking like easy E isn't him appropriating or doing something weird. It's like, I'm, I think this is cool because I think this guy is cool at this time or whatever. And so how we look at things is really interesting. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like perspective can change or a like lot. the Indian. It's Intention not like I'm, I'm making fun of the Indian or I think whatever. It's like, I think this is cool. I think they're cool yeah. or whatever. I don't, I'm not going to dress up as something I don't think is cool. I don't know. I, I could get lost in that idea, but. Well, I think what you're saying there is the intent behind the action needs to be understood. Mm-hmm. Context. I mean, context. And I mean, a photo is a photo. Let's figure out why it happened, who, where it happened, the intent behind it, the context behind it. Yeah, it's too easy to just take snapshots of reality yeah. and exploit them. And that's, you know, used as basically weaponizing these things. They're weaponizing yeah. it. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're all just trying to figure this out, you know, yeah. but I think that the key underlying thing is to treat people how we want to be treated. And that goes for any, whatever race or whatever anything is, you know, judge by your character, not by anything else. And that's how I've lived my life always. Yeah. Life is awesome. And, yeah. and we are I, back on that. I just love how many people we get exposed to from our travels, from our clients. Like we are so fortunate, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's not that complicated the way you no. just put it, right? Life isn't that complicated. Just treat people the way you would like to be treated. Yeah. You know, it's that's it's the bottom easy. line, the golden it's, rule, right? It's the it's golden, golden rule. So. Yeah. I live the same way or I have tried to. Try. Hey, again, I've probably made my mistakes. We all have, but I, I've, it was 
always on accident or I was extremely sorry the next day, you know? Good. Um, but we, yeah, that, we that learn. Is, it's that simple. It's that simple. We learn, man. And so, yeah, tattooing has just been the vehicle of our lives right now, you know, you and I, and it's been the best, mm. but there's so much out there. There's so many, there's so many, I mean, that's one thing that I've never thought I would do as a poor kid was travel. So that, that's been my favorite part of tattooing. It's like opened up cultures and people. I mean, you know, you sit in a, you go to England and you're sitting with English clients that are talking about their city and you're learning about the queen and you're, you know, or you're in Colombia and you're hearing about their local area and yeah. you're in Japan and you're talking about what, what tattoo culture looks like now or what it still, you know, the can't go to the bathhouses or all those little pieces. And we're just, we are very fortunate to get windows into so, so much, man. And uh, yeah, I just feel lucky, man. Fuck yeah. But, Gratitude. I feel that. I feel that. But I don't know how you do it with all your employees and like the layers that you have to deal with, man. It's, it's Yeah, my world's different than, than yours in that way. But uh, I'm very lucky to have an absolutely superstar wife who is probably the most incredible human being. Take away female, take away wife, just yeah. a powerhouse of a human being. And none of this would exist without her. <laughs> I mean, the only reason I even leaned into all this because I knew I had a right hand that could take yeah. me there, you know? So I, you know, the universe puts us all where we might need to be. And in my position, I've been lucky enough to be the platform for so many and be the resource for so many and sometimes be the father figure and yeah. the, the teacher of tattooing. And, you know, I just, it's allowed me to help out a lot of people, which I really enjoy. That's some of my things I'm most proud of. Yeah. It anchored me. You know, I, I haven't been as mobile as you. And then yeah. I plan on making up for that starting ish now, you know, because I've just had to be here running yeah. things. Um, but Hey, look, I feel the vibes from the universe and I can feel it winking at me. Like this is where we want you. I'm yeah. like, I, I, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I just leaned into that my whole life. And, but running it all, I've had a lot of help. Yeah. I've got a lot of good people around me. I'm learning that you can't do it anything alone. It's taken me a long time to figure that out because I never like asking for help or putting someone out, but really can't do anything legitimate anything alone. Big you can't, or, you know, the people, the community yeah. who you have around you. And, and, you know, I always thought being able to employ someone though and give someone livelihood is, is an incredible gift that you give to the community, to tattooing, to the local community, employees, and, and they can go feed their families because of what you've created. And what they're creating. I mean, yeah. artists are very independent, but that's an honorable position to be in, to be able to give people livelihood, present, provide a place yeah. and provide a business and, you know, have a great reputation that people get to live under and all that. That is beautiful, man. I, I feel like I haven't made it until I'm able to put my friends on and I haven't really put them on yet because mm -hmm. I've been kind of just treading water. You know, I have great moments and great brand collaborations that boost me financially or publicly, but I think that's the ultimate, man. I really do. I think it's incredible to be able to employ people and give them livelihood. That is just like, that's an ultimate, man. I think it's beautiful. Thank you cheers for to that. that. Hey, ah. cheer, 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 cheers to that. A hundred percent. Thank you for the compliment. Well, just anybody that's employing, you know, and you're well, one of those people. I think that's beautiful, man. Employees is a, is a, you know, these people who are with me, they're <laughs> yeah. just, they're, they're team members, man. They're independent contractors. Yeah, I mean, I look at it. I always tell people, look, I, I, what am I? I'm a shepherd. I'm a gardener. I, I, I've made some really good soil. Yeah. And, and yeah. if you guys want to grow some, some vegetables here, like, I, grow I will us? make sure the weeds don't grow. I'll make sure the mm -hmm. bugs don't come. Yeah. I will make sure the, the, the trees don't shade. So we, I'll, I'll control the temp. I'll do, you just, if you want to grow some vegetables here, come grow some yeah. vegetables here. And that's uh, always been kind of my, my mind around that, which is the tattoo industry. It's unlike um, other, you know, I own a couple other companies with my wife, which is different. It's an employee model, which is yeah. we still love and appreciate those people the same. But this, you know, tattooing is different. These yeah. are, these are independent artists yeah, who need, uh, and I'm just a one step in their journey. I don't own yeah. these people. I, I asked them politely to give me, hey, look, I'm going to give you a ton of love. You could give me a couple of years back. I love that. Yeah. They, most of them do. Most yeah. of them give me more. Yeah. And they go on to their journey. And I'm just a, I become part of that story. And that's fucking awesome. That's, that's cool. What's your perspective on like the private studio, which has emerged a lot more in the last decade versus a shop like this? And not even like maybe not even like negative stuff about it, but just there is a vast difference about the community, the shop and a solo 
person hiding like myself now. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I think it's great. My, my answer to that is do whatever works for you. Yeah. Um, I do think from a practical standpoint, it's changed a bit because, you know, it's, I've seen it happen in my own shop. You know, I, everybody had to be with a big, big brand, big label. You know, yeah. I was that guy in some regard in, in yeah. Southern California, you want to grow your career, come on board, we'll mm -hmm. help you grow it. Boom. You've got a six month waiting list off to the private studio. You, you go, it worked really well. And now, I mean, and for some, it'll work forever. I mean, yeah. you know, for some people that built a community like you've built, it's either two things, either you, like you, you've built this great community where it's going to, you probably could do that as long as you ever wanted to, or you're some rock star ass tattooer that the world's flying in to see. Yeah. But I've, you know, there are a number of those people that are going back to back to the shops now because the, this gets a little down a rabbit hole of where I sure. think the industry's going. Because at first it was Instagram shows up and suddenly everybody's their own marketing advertising agency. Yeah. But now so many are on there. It's just this big sea of it. So to get noticed mm -hmm. and be in the algorithm is getting tougher. So I'm not discouraging anyone is doing yeah. that. In fact, if you can pull it off and it makes you happy, fucking go do it. But I will say I have seen some pretty reputable tattooers leave shop, go to private, back to I'm shop. Back, yeah. Um, because there just wasn't enough business and they slowly lost that momentum, not to mention creative momentum yeah, for some totally. people. Yeah. So, and I've done it myself. I worked private for two years and uh, I, I ended up opening Guru because I, I personally was on a very big artistic journey mm -hmm. and I could tell I needed to get around some other artists to, to grow that journey. So that was mine. But yeah, you know, I think it's great. Yeah. I just don't think it's as easy as it used, used to be. No, yeah. I mean, it's always evolving, you know, yeah. shifting and changing. And as far as being by yourself, I think of it a lot, right? Because I grew up in a street shop. I grew up around yeah. artists. We're telling stories. It's all part of this community. And then I take myself out. I almost got burnt out, you know, being in Miami, Inc., New York, Inc., and having my own street shop in downtown. And I just was, you know, when I owned my own shop, I felt obligated to be there, you know, every day mm -hmm. and lead by example. And so this has given me a little more freedom and peace to just come and go as I please and deal with my clients and then dip out and have a lot more time with my lady. Like I had the first 15 years of my career. I don't even know how I had a girlfriend throughout that because I was in the shop till midnight, one, 2 AM all the time. And I look back and I'm like, how did someone even stick with me? They barely saw me. Now I have dinner with my lady every night, my fiance and we're, you know, I'm like, now I'm used to that lifestyle, but I still really cherish and love when I guest spot and I'm at a busy shop and there's other artists and I'm, learning again and like learning at new tricks or seeing how someone does something. And there's some value in that big, big value. Oh, life, life has its chapters. And yeah, it's, totally. hearing your story, I could easily <laughs> see why this is working for you right now. I mean, you were out there doing yeah. the, I don't know what to call it. I don't want to say street <laughs> shop, but just the grinding, going, doing, being in these busy shops, yeah. taking every client that walks through the door yeah. for years and years and years. And you know, hiatus, right? Yeah. You need to like reground yourself. Yeah. You're getting married soon. Yeah. Probably perfect timing. Whether that's or not nice. you'll be there in 10 years, we'll see. But for now it works great. I think yeah. that's fucking fantastic. And on that note, tell me a little bit about, about her. I, I did a little creeping on her on yeah. Instagram. She's obviously beautiful, but yeah. she's also involved in a lot of animal rescue type programs or her <laughs> own program. Could you tell us a little bit about that? She's been an animal person since she was a kid. Mm -hmm. And then the last, during COVID, it really gave her like a, a place to go. I think all of us got a little uncomfortable during COVID. Like, what are we doing? What's our mission? So she went all in on the, an actual rescue, made a 501c3. She does mostly cats because she was working from home and dogs require a lot more walking and work. They're bigger. They take up more space and time. So she found a niche where she does a lot of like groups of animals. She's, she's rescued and fostered out over 200 animals in the last few years. That's cool. Herself. Like she's pure. She's about it. I, I tell her, I'm always like, I'm the industrious one. I'm like, all right, well, let's make some animal clothing or let's do something. Mm -hmm. And she's like a, a nun, you know, she just wants to be pure <laughs> to these animals. And it's, it's very amazing. Like, uh, I always say she's a saint, you know, I'm yeah. like St. Ashley, you know, she's, she's just that's cool caring for them with all her being. And, um, I can do nothing but respect that, you know, so. Bad on. Yeah, finally getting married, man. First time after 40, 45 years of my Took life, you, you know, yeah. I just always, I came close a couple of times and then I just didn't want to do it with the wrong one. And uh, she's, she's, she's the right one. She's amazing. So this is the year, man, where we, we go all in and I do the oath, you know, and I, I practice what I preach, you know, I put a ring on it. Look so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think it's going to be beautiful. Finally of landing the plane, yeah, got a yeah, house, yeah. getting married. Look yeah, at, yeah. I'll tell you what, you're going to need 
I'll give you my cell phone. We're done. Call me. I've been uh, anchored down <laughs> yeah. for 20 plus yeah. years. <laughs> Careful what you wish it. for, I'm sure. No, you know. it's it's amazing. But I'll, there are some tricks to the, every game and I've, I know a few. But yeah, it feels right. It feels right when I hear your story. I love what, it, man. And and for me, uh, you know, to talk, talk a little bit more about her, I grew up without really a family around, right? Like no family. So my friends have been my family. And then I meet this woman who is just kind and beautiful and both of my favorite requirements in a woman, you know, kind and beautiful. Mm. And she comes with a beautiful big family, mm. Italian and Mexican and just food and family mm. every weekend. And it's just like, man, everything I ever would have hoped for big Christmases and Thanksgivings. Cool. And like, so I just like take it in and I'm just like, yeah, you, you want to go to your mom and dad's? Yeah. Let's go. You know, cause I didn't yeah. ever get to do that until, you know, my forties. So I'm just, uh, I'm just soaking it up, man. That's rad. And, uh, but on that on that comfort and stability that has been built because of my lady and because of the hard work of my past. I'm also in this weird place of like, holy shit, I've got to maintain all this. Mm. I've got to maintain this home that I built. I've ran really fast in my youth as hard as I could and worked every day. And, and, and in tattooing, you don't really get taught about finance and you don't get, no one's talking about that. Right. So like that whole side of like being an entrepreneur and an independent and a self-made person. Now you're like, oh shit, I've sprinted here and fuck, I don't get to relax. Now I've got to sprint to maintain all this. And that's been a, an interesting like chapter and my gears have turned because I always thought, oh, I'll get to this point where I've like worked really hard and I've laid a name for myself and a good reputation and my art's good and um, never good enough, but always good. And I looked around and now I'm like, holy shit, now I have to keep sprinting in a way. And it's also back to that saying I said early on, there's two ways to be rich, work more, or want less, right? So I, I, I battled that a lot. Mm. with like what I really need, what I want, and and also just appreciating everything I have. But now there's like this new pressure in my life, right? I've, mm. I've got all this now. I've got the beautiful family. I've got the home. And it was very hard. I fought hard to get here, right? Mm. And now it's like, how do, how do I keep this? And that means for me, it still means doing ev everything I've done to get here and even harder, which is, which is a weird thing, you know? And I, I'm getting older. My back has went out. Well... <laughs> Uh, it's an old saying, but what I would interject into your, please, into the zeitgeist for you right now is learn to work smarter, not harder. Oh man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm and on there's that. a lot of ways to do that. We don't need yeah. to get into that right now, but there's a thousand things I yeah. can think of just right now that yeah. I see a guy like you with your reputation and the brands you've created and all the things you have going on around you and all the relationships. Leverage your relationships. Yeah. Which, Leverage those relationships. You've got a million people out there who love you. Who would be, who would just, you could call them tomorrow and, yeah. and do business with you. You know, I'm not, and now I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but that's what I well, see for you. Well, this is what I'm learning too. Cause it's like, I never want to, um, because of my nature, ask a favor for anybody for anything. Mm, you got to get over that one. I know. And I'm like working with that and what that looks like in my life. Right. And leveraging, cause I've built my thing on never wanting anything from anyone and never needing anything from anyone, which is what I loved about tattooing. This is me. This is how I make my living. And it doesn't require anybody else. It requires yeah. the public, but it doesn't require the cool guy, old school tattooer. It doesn't require like this peer pressure of, of what I should be along the way. It really is. Uh, it's all on me. And, 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 and in that, that history of building that, I realized I can't do it alone. And I need the person behind the scenes helping me here. And they need you. I still at this age struggle with that because I don't, I just want to live and be here and live gently and not be like, hey, do this for me. Spend extra time on my shit. And I have a hard time with that. And obviously you pay people or whatever. But they need you as much yeah, as you need yeah. them. And, and, you know, and you said it to me earlier, which is for you to create some kind of um, network or platform or business that you could bring in some, some long, good friends that are, are also looking for opportunity, you know, basically sit back and just find collaboration yeah. at this point. Like, what do they need? What do I need? Why would these two things work together so well? I, to me, that's what I am, have been doing for a, yeah. a while now. Yeah. And I'm learning the magic in that and yeah. how it's such a, it's beautiful and yeah. it's good for them. It's good for me. And, uh, it's the next step. It's, you know, that lone wolf yeah. cranking like a coal miner yeah. every day. It's got a shelf life, dude. And oh, you're of no service to your wife, to your future, whatever you yeah. do with that family, to your friends when you're broken and battered and you can't even get up every day. Yeah. So, you know, we yeah. can get into that later, yeah. but I see, I can yeah. feel it coming yeah. off of you. Yeah. Uh, a new chapter opening oh, up. Oh man. And, and, I, and I love it. it. And I'm, op I'm open to the world that hard work has given me, but I know that it still takes a lot more. 
It's still hard work. It's just a different type of work. Yeah. It's not. I joked over tattooing all day. I joke with friends that I, you know, they're like, how's it going? What are you up to? And I'm like, ah, still working hard, not smart. But in that is a joke (laughs) that I I know I need to be aware of that and, and try to build that smart work. And that, and that, that's what my back surgery taught me having spine surgery. Mm -hmm. That was where I was laid up. I was out. I was, I couldn't walk. You had to contemplate. What if I couldn't tattoo ever yeah. again? Yeah. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you that story real quick. I know, I know we, we go, You're I go good. on, go. but I, yeah, uh, man, there's no timelines on chats and tats. I'm 10, 15 years into tattooing and I start feeling that back pain, you know, that bad posture back pain. Mm. And I'm in New York city and I'm working as hard as I can still, still trying to paint and draw at night, but also going out and doing like nightlife. And and that's a really, there's a big value in the connectivity, right? Like oh. those connections, those people I've met. I mean, I've met some wonderful people in my life that hopefully maybe I'll lean on at some point. But um, I was starting to feel that back pain 15 years in where my back would just start to go out, right? And that happens to a lot of tattooers. And, you know, maybe it's pills to just take that away, or maybe it's little different surgeries in the spine. Maybe it's a, a micro disectomy or where they do all these, these things. Because I'm talking about the spine now where I, I lost it. My spine ruptured 11 millimeters out, which is like a very high push of your disc. Mm. And uh, I was having days where I just fell, fell to the ground. And that was just like, that was me giving all to tattooing. You know, because I was just in it. I also had the opportunity to be at busy shops and work where there was endless clientele, which is something that we all would would cherish, you know? Mm. So I valued that and worked as hard as I could. But then I had this moment where I couldn't stand a few times in New York. And then I had this one day where my back just went out. I I, I, uh, was feeling back pain and, you know, somebody recommended like an Epsom salt bath or something. So I I, I remember this moment. I'm in my little 400 square foot apartment, 2,500 a month, tiny 400 square foot New York city apartment. It was clean. It was nice. It was in an old building. And I, I, I get into my tub, pour some Epsom salt in there and then get in. And as I'm lowering myself in there, it's really hot. And I just feel like my back just lost it. Right. So I'm in there and I'm like, fuck man, this is like, my back feels crazy. So I tried to get out of the tub. I couldn't even get out. Mm. I literally crawled out of the bathtub and I'm just like, okay, well, I've had back pain before. So this is no big deal. I'm in my tiny little New York bathroom. I get out of the tub. I was in there only for a few minutes, just feeling like this crazy new pain. I throw on some boxers and I literally, I did it on the floor and I literally crawl to my kitchen. I pull myself up on the counter in my little kitchen and I had this like the helplessest moment I've ever had in my life. And I was like, I can't stand. I cannot put pressure on my legs. I'm holding myself up on my little counter with everything and I'm shaking and I'm alone in my apartment and I'm like, holy fuck. And I was like, fuck, you know, just shit, you know? And in my mind, what has worked for me in the past when I had back issues is I would just lay on the floor with my feet up and it would like relax. And maybe it was a day or two would go by and I'd kind of feel better again and I go. Never miss days of work, right? But this every once in a while, hey, I can't come in today. I'm just like, my back's a little out. So this day I'm like, I'm like shaking. I'm scared. I'm in my apartment in New York and I'm like just alone with no help. And I'm like, fuck. I'm like, I can't stand. I can't put pressure on my legs. I fucking go down to my knees again. I crawl to my living room floor. I grab my phone. I'm in my boxers. I grab some water out of the fridge because I'm in my tiny little kitchen so I can just lean up and grab. And I go lay on the floor. I'm like, I'm just going to lay here for a while with my feet up. And this is going to alleviate the pain. And like, you know, it'll mellow out. (laughs) And I'm laying there and I'm there for hours and hours. And I call a couple of buddies, Tim Hendricks, one of my good friends who had back surgery. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what to do, man. I can't even put pressure on my legs. You know, and he's like coaching me through a little bit because he had something similar not too many years before me. And uh, I'm just like kind of scared. I, you know, I, you know, I've got friends everywhere and buddies and, you know, all over the world or whatever, but I'm like, here I am. I can't stand. I don't know what the fuck to do. And that's, that moment was really heavy for me in my life. It was one of the gnarliest moments in my personal life because everything else I can work hard and fix it with like financial stability that I'm building. But that was a moment where I was like, like on the floor, can't walk. The moment move. when you needed others' help. Yeah. So th- then I, you know, I was date. I was dating this girl, and she called me, and she's like, "Hey, c- uh, can I come over? You want to hang out tonight?" <laughs> and I'm like, uh, "I'm kind of like hurting right now. I'm on the floor. I got a little back thing." And she's like, "I'm gonna come over and help you." And I said, "I don't even know if I can get the door to let you in. I can't even let you in. I can't even go to my thing because I had a. It was an old building, but it had a buzzer. I could let them in. They come up the stairs. I couldn't get to the door. The buzzer, nothing. And she goes." oh man, um, okay, well, I'm gonna come by later and check on you. And I'm still trying to be tough, you know? Yeah, uh, well, I don't, I don't have a way to let you in my apartment. 
And she goes, do you have a key at the shop or something? And I was like, oh, fuck, I do have a spare key at the shop. I had it in my, my tattoo craftsman drawer, you know? So she went and found it, came in and, and it was like, I had been there from like the morning. It was like nighttime. It was dark out. And uh, she came in with that spare key and she's like, oh, fuck, you're still on the floor. Oh. And I'm like, yeah, I, I can't move. She's like, why don't you call the ambulance? I'm like, no, no, you know, we don't have, ins- you know, I didn't have insurance at the time. I'm, oh. I'm like, I'm not going to go to the hospital. That's like not even on my list. But she planted the seed and I'm like, well, let me see how I feel tomorrow. So she stayed with me that night and just kind of was like a nurse mm. situation. And then I had another friend that was a tattooer at Invisible, one of the, one of the brilliant tattooers there in Lower East Side, um, Regino Gonzalez, RG. He's just insane. I don't know. Are you familiar with his work? Mm. You got to check it out. He's probably, he's familiar with Invisible, but yeah, this guy, Regino, he, he had tattooed all the gangsters and drug dealers in Oceanside and I knew of him and then he moved to New York and he's, his work is to me, he's like one of the top five tattooers. He's just incredible. Mm. I mean, for my taste, right? Right. Guys like Garver look up, like I think look up to him, you know, he's like an amazing artist, really nice guy. Mm. He's like, I got like a Viking or something. He's like, I'll skateboard it over. (laughs) Like, you know, he came over with a couple of Vicodins. I thought I'd just kill the pain and like get through this. Right. And then um, he came over. That was amazing. <laughs> didn't do anything. The little Vikings or whatever didn't do anything. So about five a.m., I just and, I, and meanwhile I'm in the agonizing pain. It's not even just like I'm laying here and the pain's gone. It's like I'm hurting. Mm. I'm achy. And so five a.m., I call this EMT buddy of mine that lived in New Jersey. I was waiting for him to wake up, not call him too early. I'm like, hey man, I just needed someone to say, hey, you, it's okay to go do this. I say, hey, I'm on the floor. I can't walk. I'm in pain all day, all night. I've been here for like at this point. I don't know, 20 hours on the floor. And Jesus. Uh, he gave me like the, the okay that I needed or whatever to call 911. <laughs> so, and she would, the girl that was there, she had been call, say, Hey, just call the fucking doctor. Call 911. Like, come on, man, what are you doing? And I'm still thinking, oh, I'll relax and it'll mellow out. So at 5 a.m., I had these two, e- two EMTs come in and carry me. They t- picked me up. Carry, they're like, Can you walk? I'm like, No way, dude. I can't fucking move. I'm hurting. They put me in this little seat and carried me down my four story building. I got into the ambulance and they gave me some like painkillers and took my vitals and all that. And I felt a little bit of relief. Mm. I went to the hospital in New York. I forget which one. There's a couple of main ones and got, um, the doctor came and checked on me. I said, oh, my spine, blah, blah, blah. They gave me some painkillers, waited like an hour. They're like, what's it? One to 10. How's your pain? I said, it's 10 still. <laughs> 10? I'm like, For nothing real, subsided. Dude. Like Ooh. it was like my disc had like pushed out, hit my sciatic nerve. And I was just, my legs, oh. I couldn't walk. And then they gave me morphine. And let me tell you, that was beautiful. After, at this point, 30 hours of pain, it subsided, you know? I felt no pain. I was like, ah. Oh. I've had that experience once. But then not having health insurance and still like not being a big hospital guy, I was like, okay, well, I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor was like, take this, whatever. I didn't go, hey, can you do an MRI? Like, what's going on? Just give me a year's worth of morphine. Yeah, just send me, you know, and I'm like, I don't feel any pain. So I, I slumped over my, the girl I was seeing. We walked to my apartment. I rested. I took these painkillers every day for a week and I was feeling better. And I thought, okay, I can get ahead of this. I'll move back to Cali. I'll get some yoga going. I'll fucking find, you know, I'll figure this out. I'm, I can rebuild. You know, I was a healthy guy most of my life, surfing and all this stuff. Ended up being okay. Moved home to Cali and was still having back issues. Took another trip on a plane to Spain. And there's a whole, you know, moment, you know, another two hour story there. Cut my trip early, came home to California and um, uh, was like, I got to get an MRI and see what's really going on. Mm-hmm. So I went and got uh, an MRI and the doctor looked at it and he goes, wow, man, <laughs> you're in emergency status. Anything happens worse than this, you'll probably lose control of your bowel movements. You're fucked. You don't, we're going to go into emergency surgery. And at this time I'd already researched back surgeries. And like what that looked like. And here in the States, a lot of people like to do the fusion. That's like the go-to in, in America. Mm. We fuse it, we put it together. And all I've heard was like maybe 50-50 if, if you're not always in pain for the rest of your life versus on painkillers or whatever. So I was, I was afraid of doing that. So then I'm talking with Tim Hendricks a lot who had three disc replacements and was surfing and throwing his kids in the air. And I'm like talking with him a lot about his experience. And he's like, Germany is the way to go. Research this place. You know, I was really close friends with him. I value him as an intelligent guy, well-researched, saw the success he's had. And I was like, well, that's what I'm doing. So I sent my MRIs to Germany. They said, yeah, this is a really bad case, but it's normal. No big deal. The doctor there had at the time been doing these surgeries, disc replacement surgeries for 10 years. Felt very comfortable knowing what Tim had went through, seeing a little bit of the stories of people. So I took this mission to... Bremen, Germany, in this beautiful little orthopedic studio in this little small town, got checked out, went there by myself. And then my girl at the time met me and her mom. 
And um, I was feeling good. I felt, I always joked that this was the first time in my career that I had a vacation <laughs> <laughs> because I was forced to lay down and watch Netflix and figure it out. And I had never done that in my life ever. I've never stopped, you know? So got there, got checked out. I was the first one of the group. This place in Bremen, Germany is amazing, dude. It's beautiful, you know, state of the art, mm -hmm. like medical care. And um, I felt very comfortable. And I, I only got to meet the actual doctor one time the day before my surgery. And uh, he was this like cold German guy. And I said, how are your patients? Like 10 years down the road. Like how I'm like trying to figure out, is this still the right thing? I'm here, but you know, I want some, I want to feel good about this. Yeah. <laughs> I want some reassurance. So he's like in a very cold German way and accent. He's like, I don't talk to my clients after they're done. They're fixed. And it was this really fun, like cold <laughs> answer that was awesome. He's like, I don't have a relationship with them. They're done. They're fixed. No need to talk to them again. Yeah, he was just like, they're gone. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. It was mm -hmm. cold. It wasn't like, oh yeah, you'll be okay. We'll give you that. You know, it was just like, yeah. they're fixed, they're done. And uh, I was like, okay, shit. So the next day, got the surgery. It was 45 minutes. You know, all the stuff leading up to it and checking my right. heart rate and all the stuff the days before. Mm -hmm. And I'm there. 45 minute surgery changed my life. So to be clear, they they did a disc replacement? Yeah. So, so they, they put a... A artificial disc. Okay, artificial So for disc. the last, I don't know if it's been eight or nine years, I have a artificial disc in my L5S1, which is the lowest spot on your spine, okay. spinal cord. And that was the one that was ruptured fully. Mm -hmm. They put this, it looks like an Oreo cookie. It's got a titanium top and bottom and it has a nucleus center that is made of some other mesh. It has a little bit of movement. Mm -hmm. They put this machine down, it opens the spine and they fit, they take out the old remnants of the disc and they fit the new one and they insert it. It has a little bit of spikes on the top and bottom and it, and they re-let re your spine connect. And it basically acts as an actual disc. It's an mm -hmm. artificial disc mm -hmm. and it's sized right for me and it's in my spine. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was wild, but I instantly, the pain was gone. The sciatic nerve was released. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was, the whole thing since then was just healing the insertion, which is a stomach insertion. They move your guts and they go in through the front. Mm -hmm. And they fitted me for the disc. And here I am in Germany, this little town with my, you know, my ex-girlfriend at the time, and I go through the first week in the hospital care, got that, felt the pain relieved, but now I'm just a huge wound in the stomach. Mm. Maybe like a woman with a C-section, obviously not as intense, but intense in its own way. Mm. And um, since then I healed, I walked, I stayed there for a week in a nice hotel that they had set up and they have a physician come out, making sure you don't get blood clots and get massages in your legs and different things. And I've been almost a hundred percent since, wow. which is insane. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to be able to go through. Um, but yeah, I always joke that was my first vacation in my life. <laughs> and uh, I- Let's I, make I'm, your next one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was a beautiful ending to this, this story about my spine, you All know, right. but in that moment takes me back to like, how do I work smarter in my career? Because I've, I've labored to tattooing as far as I could go. I've owned shops, I've worked for people, I've been busy, I've been fortunate. And uh, I, I killed my body in the meantime, you know? And um, it gave me a second look at it all. Mm. So I, I still love, you know, I embedded in me the hard work and work as hard as you can. And if you're slow, you travel to a shop that's busy and maybe guest spot and make some money. And it was always there and that was it. So now I, I am like, okay, let me, let me work smarter. So in the last, you know, five years, I've been working on projects and brands and um, working on some stuff mm. that uh, hopefully will, will bear few, uh, fruit mm. in the future. Um, but that was a wild part of my journey, of my journey as a tattooer, um, giving it to, yeah, giving definitely. my body to the game. Well, and realizing <laughs> you, there was a wake up moment, like yeah. this stops working at some point, you know, yeah. and, and you can't count on these hands and eyes ripping yeah. tats to the day you die. Yeah. So every tattooer comes to this moment at some point, everybody's situation is different. Some people have a, perhaps a, 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 a wife or a husband that they take oh, the retirements over yeah, there or yeah. they get this. But for those those of us who don't, yeah, you got to yeah. start thinking how to work uh, yeah. in ways that don't involve your physical yeah. labor as much. I always say I'd like to build some products so I'm not the product anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love doing it yeah. and I love it. But, uh, you know, the long game, you think about this shit when you're late 30s, 40s in general. Like, mm -hmm. what's my what's my future look like? What's my the next 20 years? You see all these old tattooers that are like struggling or barely making mm -hmm. it and have these shops. And it's it's like it's such a warning you know, mm. for the long game of life. So, and I can't rely on my lady. I can't rely on her family. I mean, it's really still up to me. So I'm still looking at like what smarter looks like as a tattooer. So when I partner with brands and I, you know, I've been very fortunate and all of those have come through personal relationships. It's not been, I've never looked, I've never had like managers. I've never, and I've just been paired with amazing people. 
So, you know, right now you mentioned the monster thing and monster energy as a big company. I'm like, Oh shit, it's just like another big company. Am I selling my soul? <laughs> um, which is, you know, luckily we look at those things differently now with selling out quote, quote, quote unquote. Um, but what I found with, with that company in particular, man, they are wonderful people that work there. They're happy. Mm -hmm. They love the way the company's ran and the way that they're trying to do and implement themselves in industry isn't like, what's the coolest, fastest thing. It's like, no, we, we want to work with you. I, I met one of the guys that was high up there and he liked me and it was a personal connection. And that's the only reason I'm there because of this one person, this guy, Aaron, another, another Aaron, some mm -hmm. good Aaron's out there. <laughs> um, and I partnered with him over the long game where it wasn't just like, oh, I met you. What, what can I do for Monster? What can I, what, how can I get some of your money? You know, it was like, I see the good in you. You see the good in me. I, I've been a guy in my industry for a long time that's hopefully had a good reputation. Yeah, you're a big corporate company, it seemingly, but um, every interaction with them has just been beautiful. I mean, now I'm tattooing at the X Games, doing winter and summer and traveling with them for events and uh, every interaction I have with them, their athletes has just been an incredible new chapter in my life with like a new platform for clientele where, you know, luckily it's like these amazing athletes, professional skiers, snowboarders, motocross riders, guys that I wasn't really involved in. And so I get to kind of meet all these new people. They value my art as a company and as people. And so um, I can't sing their praises enough. And as a time where our industry feels unstable, you hear a lot of artists like, oh, I'm not busy or I used to be booked up and I'm not. You know, I'm just like in my lane, you know, and I'll look around a little bit, but I'm like, my lane's pretty cool. Created yeah. this beautiful roadway here and I'm, I'm in it and I'm in it, you know, whatever the quote unquote right reasons are partnering and working with big companies. It's always been organic. It's always been something that, um, is through a personal connection. It's never right. been like a weird email. that's like, Hey, I want to do something. It's just like, I met this guy. He happens to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's been, um, people have really been my savior in this and the connectivity with people. And I think that all goes back to treating people good and being the same guy at every, at every moment at every meeting, not being like some guy with like hidden agendas or any of that shit, you know? So I, I, I actually have to sing them praises. You know, they've been wonderful this whole year. I'm in a big contract with them. We're working on projects and I'm tattooing athletes and we're doing some, some uh, social media filming for cool content. And I'm very, very happy. And they make a water, which is great. <laughs> yeah you brought that not I was just like, for the late night charge ups that's cool yeah. no and, and you know that's exactly right you have led a life of authenticity and relationships and putting your heart out there and putting your work out there and uh, i have no doubt that you know karma's real yeah you know you don't you don't have a big credit card debt on your soul yeah. and uh, how that will play out for you you're still you're still figuring that out but a lot of opportunity yeah. a lot of good stuff coming ahead our, bu our buddy Rob Ruiz, the chef, always said, you can never put too much money in the karma bank. Yeah. You know? That's so true. You know? Good dude, by the way. Yeah. Rob, I heard you have a new restaurant <laughs> down in Mexico. I'm going to come seeing you soon. Yeah, Via de Guadalupe. I got to go down there and see him. Yeah, we both do. <laughs> let, let me know. Maybe we'll go yeah, together. I'm dying cool. to get back to love that place. Love that area. Right on, man. Well, yeah. this is, uh, thank you for sharing your your story. I know it's not over. No, in fact, man. it's uh, there's a whole new chapter beginning, <laughs> yeah. which uh, I'll yeah. probably have to have you back on. I will have you back on here in five years. I can, oh, I can cool. sense a lot of... There's stuff happening, yeah. man. There's stuff brewing, There's things, you know? doors opening and new chapters yeah. opening. And I want to hear more about that. So you're an amazing guy. I love that you, uh, you value the old school things in life, honesty, authenticity, friendship, respect. Um, that's one of the main reasons I want to have you on yeah. here. I feel the same way. So, love it. um, and you also are a man of the tattoo world, tattoo history. You've, you've been around, you've seen a lot. Yeah. Thanks for sharing some of those stories yeah, with us today. Man. It's beautiful. Thanks for, thanks for uh, having me in your beautiful do space. Have, do we have a glass to toast? I mean, I, I, got, a, I got a little one sip. Last like, okay, toast, one last, one last, one last toast, toast to close this okay. thing out. And after this, you can tell people where we can find, where they can find you. I can find you. I already know where to find you, where they can find you. <laughs> and uh, we'll get you off to your golf game. Yeah, yeah. You didn't mention that, everybody. Luke likes to golf. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's got I'm the I'm a late bug. bloomer. You know, I used to think it was just for like rich old white men, you know? And uh, never was something I ever looked at. And I've been finding like such peace and joy in that, man. I, I got a bad knee from surfing. So I was like, what's my outlet, right? We all need certain types of outlets. So yeah. golf, to plug golf, it has just been a beautiful way to, like a cigar, to spend time with some people you like for hours, which is something that a lot of, other than tattooing, you don't get that moment with people in life that much. So 
Everyone puts their phones down and spends yeah. four hours. You're out, out there. You work outdoors. Dude, the landscape is beautiful. Fresh cut grass, green oh, pastures. Just being out there, I always sit and just go, "Wow, this is." I, I'm I'm so lucky that I can do this. Yeah. And then you know, I try not to get frustrated at the game because it's a it's 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 simple and it's you know in the rules and what it is, but it's very hard to master, which I think oh, is what keeps me going back. It's frustrating. Yeah, yeah I've tried. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna dive in next year, the year after. Well, whenever the it, you know, yeah, I just haven't had time for golf. Dude. Yeah, time, it's a time-consuming game. But I agree with all that, and I can't <laughs> wait to go golfing with you sometime. Yeah. So, man. cheers to that. Tell tell cheers, everybody man. once you're done with this little sip. Mm. Where can folks find you? Right now, I'm still on Instagram <laughs> until yeah. I disappear. Just Luke Westman at uh, Luke Westman. That's it. I was you know early, so I didn't have to have any weird numbers or stuff in my name. Still posting tattoos and and life's escapades. That's it, man. That's me. I have a LukeWestman.com and it's got all the fancy accolades and all the clients and fancy clients on there and some of the products I make and artwork and but yeah, yeah. And if you know, if you see me on the street, say what up. I'd love that, you know. And uh yeah, I'm just plugging away. But there's some there's some I've planted some really great seeds, so there's gonna be some really special trees in the next few years. Well, keep me in mind, man. I know you got yeah. a, a lot of, pro I'll keep you in mind for my <laughs> projects. There's got to be some way to co-collaborate yeah. on something rad in the future. Um, for all you people out there listening who want to, who, who are interested in like, not only an amazing human being, but a guy that's rooted in a traditional, I would say LA vibe tattooing, you know, sure. yeah. which I happen to really love. Go check him out. He does some amazing tattoos. You've already heard about his story and what an amazing guy he is. And uh, all I can say now is uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for the likes, the shares, yeah. the subscriptions. Luke, yeah. thank you for making the trip down here to, to yeah, hang man. with us today and sharing a bit of your story. I know there's a lot more to yeah. it, but I appreciate you for that. And uh, that's it for now. Until next time, one more last yeah. toast. Woo! Cheers. Peace out. Fuck it. That's, it. that's what that says right there. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> That's the greatest, after every great decision I ever made, I, yeah. right before that I said yeah. fuck it, so. Fuck it everybody, we'll see you on the next one.